And here we are once again. Welcome to Legends of the Drowned Isles, a fifth at D&D campaign, homebrew campaign, it should be noted, uh, called The Great Confusion. I'm the host and DM and responsible for the world being in tatters as it is. Not our world, but the world of Omatia. Uh, I should specify that part. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One, and I'm happy to be joined by my players, starting on my left with Silas. My name is Silas Marsh. I am playing Pat for today. <laughs> yes. Uh, and Silas is a bard block. I'm making that up. It's going to be a big thing. You're on mute. Yep. Yep. I couldn't figure out where I was muted. I unmuted the other one. <laughs> um, so my name is Muffy, uh, and I am playing Annie, who is a rogue slash fighter. And I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medric, half-orc cleric. That rhymes. Cleric. Kamar of Ignis, no less. Yes. Well, once again, uh, we return to the world of Amesha, the small town of Aelthwater on the sort of southwestern coast of, uh, of Eskis. Where this crew has recently um, came exploding out of a building, uh, a sort of a little bit of violent uh, diuretic action uh, after having escaped uh, with friends that you've rescued from the fearsome clockwinder. I don't know if fearsome is necessarily the right word. Gruesome, perhaps. Uh, as overhead, you see what clockwinder was up to seemed to come to fruition exploding out of the cedar uh, point ridge is a gigantic organ or something like that which you spent several hours kind of wandering through but you did rescue two of your friends dr marigold the local alchemist and sandy bell one of the three bells of the inn where you call home now you find yourself uh freed from all of that uh, perhaps taking a moment taking a breath to relax and perhaps also uh, answer a few of the questions of the curious onlookers. The move along, other... nothing to see here. <laughs> the other end of the gate, where which led to this uh, strange realm, um, was inside of a warehouse that you attract Clockwinder to. That warehouse was utterly destroyed in the strange cosmic energy reverberation that, co that was uh, created in the aftermath. However, limbs intact, friends saved. It's now time to start looking forward to the next big thing. In a day and a half, it'll be the big performance, a challenge as part of the ongoing, uh, uh, I can't, well, I don't want to say circus, but the ongoing events uh, as part of the festivities. Uh, the festivities. I had a term for that where I'm, I'm missing my term. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, uh, we will do the next part kind of rapid if there's anything in particular you want to do over that day. You did pick up a number of, of items. We can go through those items as well. Between um, yourselves and uh, Dr. Marigold, they can be identified pretty easily. Marigold's um, uh, morgue <laughs> slash uh, experimentation rooms are in somewhat of a shambles. And his assistant, uh, Dolver, is in, uh, he's only also part of himself. <laughs> <laughs> Missing an arm that was helping to guide you, uh, which now seems to become inactive. Uh, Marigold seems uh, uh, disturbed, not disturbed, uh, annoyed, upset, a little angry at, uh, at losing his friend. But he is confident that his friend will return but it will take some time. Uh, Sandy, however, uh, will go back to the Three Bells, and while she's polite to Dr. Marigold, you believe there might be somewhat of a, um, let's say, lingering association with him for a little while. That particular uh, uh, pairing might be on hold. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, they're both uh, grateful to all of you for having saved their lives. So... What would you like to do? Is there something of these uh, items you would like to take a look at? Or do you want to discuss the aftermath of what just happened or plan what's coming up next? 
Well, I have a feeling it's probably best to let uh, Sandy and Mary go like wind down a little bit and come to talk to them later. So the items seem like a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we can retire back to the inn and and uh, Silas can take a look at them uh, once he's had a few minutes to rest. Um, do you have uh, identify? Um, yep. Okay. Perfect. A good idea might be nice with uh, Arendelle because yes in our investigation mm -hmm. yes i want to make sure he's we, we, we tell him these details in private is or is that necessary or yeah probably a good idea you guys do that silas is gonna go take a rest in the inn yes <laughs> he's drained and hurting Okay. Um, does that mean that Annie and Medrick are going to make a report, or just Annie? We don't have to go through this in real time, but um... I mean, I probably go too. Either way. Okay. Yep. Um, Silas, you probably accompany Sandy back to the inn, and uh, she kind of is is moving in that determined. I'm sort of angry. I'm sort of in shock. I'm sort of in trauma, but I just want to go home. Kind of stomp, um, which for a uh, a halfling is uh has a surprising Absolutely adorable well it's adorable but also has that surprising bow wave like a big uh, iceberg moving through water where people just sort of move out of the way as she moves forward uh they can see that she's in a pretty rough state but at the same time not a single person is going to get in her way um and even when she goes back in she raises a hand to one of her sisters who's at the counter uh, cutting her off, uh, saying, basically, later. I'll explain later. Um, but, uh, yeah, Sandra, uh, I think, was up front before. Uh, is happy to see you, Silas, and there's no cost for the room. And if you need food, she will have it delivered as well. That sullen young boy probably is going to be delivering it. He hasn't been fired yet? Apparently not. <laughs> It's only been the morning. Can be. So Silas, you go back up to uh, the or you go to a room, rest uh, as you will. Sure. Uh, Annie and Medrick, are you going to the uh, the windmill? Yeah, well, the guard, yeah, yeah, the guard windmill. Yeah. Okay. Um, you find Verandell there. Yep. Um, no one currently is incarcerated. Um, Looks like they've they've let, uh, uh, I believe, it was Dale who was there last time you were, you were yes. there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. But uh, looks like Dale has been let go for reasons, uh, and currently just uh, Varendel going through uh, what looks like a number of logs. Um, Annie, you know that with the uh, with the grand spect spectacle in town and the ra increased number of people. Um, there's also been an increased number of reports, an increased number of incidents, uh, and it looks like he's trying to to kind of correlate all that together. You see him writing down on a third piece of paper. Uh, but at your coming in, despite perhaps some disheveled vision <laughs> that you both represent, uh, he, he has a mix shit. <laughs> yeah, you, you got a mixture of of concern and relief to see you. Uh, but then you can give your report. If you wish to give it in real time, you're welcome to. Otherwise, um, you can describe the, the the top points. Is Verandell alone right um, now? Right now, yes, in this office. But you do know that others uh, sometimes are upstairs resting or okay. getting ready. Uh, so I'll give basically the... So we found Marigold and the innkeeper who were both missing. Um in kind of an explosion as we were trying to get out of things. Thunder did get away. Cedar Point Ridge and doesn't exist anymore. They find some yeah. <laughs> stomach or something that from that area. It, it it doesn't make sense, but it also just I don't know what happened either. <laughs> 
We'll find more details. I, I'm sure uh, Dr. Marigold knows a little. No, he, I think he knows more than what he's letting on. Um, you get the impression that maybe Verendel should be a little bit more surprised or shocked or disturbed by the, the things as you lay them out. But you also get the impression that he's had a lot of different reports and a few recently that have given him to question whether they were saying anything truthful. Coming from the two of you, he, he assumes that it's truthful. He assumes uh, that you're not lying to him. And just sort of just sort of nods at each of the ridiculous aspects. Um, he does pull out a, uh, a, a uh, packet of paper that he has in one of his lower drawers, makes a couple of notes on it. Annie, you kind of get a glance at the, the outer title, and it's a clockwinder file. Um, it's not that <laughs> thick, but it has kind of different little bits and notes in there. Um, also, I'll say, you know, because we did get, I believe we overheard... Did we? I believe we overheard name. We, we did. Fuck. Farvin. <laughs> yeah. Farvin, Farvin the clock wonder. Farvin, yeah. We'd actually heard that name before. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would mention that in the information as well and that warrants I will it. on it i'll be like oh and that sort of referred to as this thing as well <laughs> that warrants uh an extra note in the file and you can see a sort of active line being drawn on one of the pages as if these things are now connected um that he had not had connected before um and he does tell you that we had heard the name Farvin before, but we hadn't been able to connect it to the Clockwinder directly. We had assumed it was uh, someone working with him, but, well, I guess one less person to look for. Yep. It's a name he Makes now hates, sense. apparently. Do you have any sense of what he's become, then? Or what he needed? Did we as... actually see him? You never actually did. Okay. I don't, but uh, Dr. Mary Goldwood. Uh, they, they used to be partners and friends, but that is clearly not the case anymore. Uh, I think he was trying to recruit uh, Dr. Mary Gold to work on this terrifying project of his. That's concerning. Mm -hmm. It is connected to the, uh, the water spout. What happened down there? What's this leading to? Do you have any sense uh, of that? I don't know yet. It's like he's working with somebody who shall not be named to put together a giant creature, a titan, to do what I'm assuming is not going to be anything good. I mean, I have a lot of a lot of understanding and uh, faith in both of you, but uh, the Titans are myths. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you think this sounds crazy, yeah. I do too. Is I would never have believed it. I just came out of a giant queen. Titans. I mean, it is an argument in favor of something very strange. Yes. Um, you don't think it could have been for some other purpose, though? It's possible. But this is my best guess. I could be wrong, but uh, I have a feeling that. Mary Gold would know more. I, I, we, we can go talk to him. You have a good relationship with him, and I'd appreciate that. I think if you were to see me coming while we're friendly, um, he would see it more as an official visit. And the services he provides for the town are good. He's respected. He has a good reputation. Although this mm. Dover worker of his does cause a few concerns. Uh, Dover will be out of commission for the foreseeable future. He's gone away? He got a bit torn apart by uh, Clockwinder's servants. 
Oh, well. Mary Gold says he can bring him back, but I, I'm, I'm assuming this will take time. I see. Well, mixed blessings. Do you think we're going Thank to you. see more of this Clockwinder, then? Uh, he flew away in a giant organ, so... Probably not. Not for a little bit, at least. Maybe. If there's another giant body part lingering in, in the immediate area. Well, let's hope that there's not. There's been an we... arm, a stomach, and, and a spleen, so... Yeah, the stomach is still in its original location, I believe, so that might be where he's going to go next. And where would that be? I'll look at uh, Annie. We might so want to discuss this. So we've ended up... <laughs> probably, probably best to not have any... But... So far, we've been in three giant organs. So. Well, I guess if you find any more, this is rapidly becoming something larger than I can deal with. <laughs> Literally. But I'm... Yep. Yeah. Yes. And while whoever built these things certainly had a body in mind. I'm not entirely convinced that's the likelihood. Again, maybe these are remnants of, of Titans, but the Titans were, well, literally legendary. Maybe this is the, the real element of the legend then. Maybe there was something more to it than just legend, but maybe there was something less too. There's something i'll lower my voice as i tell him this there, there's something ancient we've discovered a few items with athlonian writing and there was the name of somebody mentioned who has somehow returned and is trying to put the, this titan together so the athlons one legend and another legend and i'll show him the i think this, this oh, is bigger than any of us <laughs> I'll show him the crystal charm. I picked this up inside the whatever the fuck we were in. And what is this? There is Ath there's Athlonian writing, writing on there. Is it? I, I can't read it. I, I'm not familiar with the, the writing style, but I don't know them all. And th there was a vase we found a few weeks ago when the sea devils attacked this, the town. Uh, I asked... I brought it to uh, Marigold, and he seemed to understand it, and he mentioned a name. And ever since that name was mentioned, je I'll just gesture, like, vaguely at everything. <laughs> like, all this shit. <laughs> all right. Uh, then perhaps There's a lot of missing I pieces. Is... Times it, perhaps it's time to get someone with a higher that. authority to come involved. I do have a meeting, well, there is the party, which isn't exactly the meeting I was hoping to have with the Baron and Baroness. They aren't accepting any other meetings. I've been sending them reports, but they haven't been replying to them. As far as I know, they're getting them, but they've been kind of um, solitary. Weird. Yeah. I'm hesitant to go any further. But maybe it is perhaps time that I reached out to some of my contacts in the capital. That would be good. Oh. You let me worry about that. For now, thank you very much for the assistance you've given once more. I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Marigold and... Was it Sandy? Sandy was taken, right? Yes. Yes. She's safe now. Good. Well, if you have anything else to, to report, let me know. Um, I'd prefer a written report of this as well for my own records. Something I can stare at with a cold drink on a calm moment. I'll, I'll look in Annie's direction as in, like, you're going to do the writing, right? <laughs> I can do that. 
<laughs> I hate papers. <laughs> they tend to crisp and curl up and dry out. And sometimes they like, just burn in my hands. Like, oops, <laughs> got to start over. Yeah, I would imagine that you started to think about that and, and Verendel kind of pulls some of the paper stacks over a little bit further away <laughs> on his desk, just in case. They're a little dry on the edges now. Um, well, thank you. Still keen to go to the party, Annie? Good. I'm glad this didn't put you off. Maybe it'll be pleasant. Change pace. Of course. I'll bring you that report at some point tonight. And basically go to my room, clean up and... Okay. Um... Were there any special plans that Medrick had before we reconvene the three of you sitting in uh, the Three Bells? No, just uh, stop by the temple real quick. If there's anybody there, like, take care of requests and all that. Change into something nicer, clean up a little bit, and then go to the inn to meet okay. everybody else. There's a, a few minor uh, requests for blessings. Um, someone wants to, to bless their unborn child. Um, another person wants to uh, have a... a uh, a boil removed. Uh, with, with fire or surgically removed? <laughs> well, they came to the Temple of Ignis um, yeah. for holy intervention. Uh, if you ask them whether they want fire or with some medical thing, yeah, I guess they do cringe, but there's also, you know, do you know how to take a boil? I can do a medicine with... check. <laughs> you certainly can. Uh, where is... Did I just start? And make a religion check as well for the other blessing. Unless you want to cast a spell. Right. Medicine and religion. Medicine is a 22. Okay. And dirty 20. And religion for is a 20. Nice. So the boil could be removed with fire. Uh, it would probably leave a larger scar. You do know that a very sharp knife and a very uh, uh, tight hand could remove it. Um, you don't really have that kind of implement here because you're not really a doctor. Um, I do have, have a dagger. You do have a dagger. You can try to do it with the dagger if you want. I'll just point out that a dagger is not a scalpel. <laughs> it, it's not. Yeah. Hmm. I don't want to injure anybody, so I'll just uh, use that medicine roll. That that was a twenty-two total, and let them know like what kind of like ointments and like salves to apply to it. Okay. And give them the blessing of Ignis. So so let's let's make these uh, Ignian flavored. Um, what would be a salve to put on? What would be the the nature of the salve? I'm thinking it, it, it it's a, a, a burning feeling at least. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, some ingredient that I. Like, real life me doesn't know these things anymore, but I used to when I was in university. <laughs> you have to heat it up real nice and apply it. And then, no matter how much it burns, just leave it there. Only a little bit, but just directly on the boil. So, hot Have knife through butter. <laughs> Habanero pepper. Thank God it's a fantasy universe, and we're not thinking of, of rubbing, you know, burning habanero into a wound. <laughs> God. <laughs> You won't be bothered by the wound anymore because you'll be screaming from the pain. <laughs> the... <laughs> Although right. it's a low roll, that's what it would have been. Yeah, what? yeah. This will actually work. Um, but there is, I mean, everything with Ignis is flavored through the, the power of heat and the power of burning. And they do often recommend burning down things to, to cleanse them. So um, rather than doing it personally, you have this recommendation for medicine. They, they seem grateful if a little dubious, but you seem convinced, convincing and, and knowledgeable about what you're saying. So they will go off and, uh, find the necessary ingredients to make the poultice themselves. Cool. cool. Um, for the religion role, and I'll, give, I'll cast guidance on them for when they, for when they attempt it. Okay. So a little, a little, uh, uh, flaming ritual, um, for them as well. Yeah. Um, and the name of the fire and the ember and the ever flame, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
for the blessing for the unborn child, what does Medric do? You do it well. You have a 20 religion. Mm, I'll put my hands like around her belly, like with her consent, of course. And do a prayer to Ignis. Like bless this child. May he be like hot tempered, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um... And... Well, how unborn is the child? Like, if, if I cast, like, guidance on childbirth, is that actually a thing? <laughs> it's not imminent. It's more okay. of the, the, the child could arrive within the next month, so she's very pregnant. Okay. But it's not like it's going to arrive in the next day or so. It's mostly, we're here by the temple. Oh, look, the, the guardian of the temple has come back. We'll see if we can get the Phoenix Guardian's uh, blessing while we're here. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. So, uh, Ignis, bless, uh, Ignis, bless this child to grow up big and strong and with a fiery temper. May he burn bright. Not, not, not literally, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and with the 20 roll, I'll say that the, the, uh, the, the pregnant woman takes this as a, a lighter moment, not, did you just say my lighter. child should burn? Uh, and when you lay your hands on, she does flinch a little bit, and you can see there's there's a, a bit of, of warmth, a bit of a, of a light blue flame around your fingers. And when you pull your hand back, there's actually a small part right around her navel, which has been uh, slightly scarred by heat, but it makes the navel look a little bit more like a starburst. Nice. Uh, and she kind of, uh, she laughs with delight, and she kind of holds on to her stomach. Oh, <laughs> feisty indeed. Uh and uh, I apologize for that. any kicks that come from me inside your stomach for the next month or so, but your child will be strong. That just means he's healthy and strong. Thank you. Go so. into the light. Bless. Wait, no. Wait. <laughs> the sunlight, the fire, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, bless the child and Excellent. poultice. All right. Like, I memorized, like, the Indian sayings, but it's like as soon as I have to actually say them, I just, like, freeze and forget. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I burn and forget, not freeze. <laughs> Freezing's for squares. <laughs> you, and... you make up your own, and it kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You reconvene at the Three Bell. Silas, you've had a chance to, to rest and relax a little bit. Maybe... Um, Wash your face, uh, find a bit of a of a of a refresh of clothes. Do you have press digitation? I think you do. Oh yeah, yeah. So you don't have to change to to become. He has all the fresher. things. Um, Annie, you had also uh, kind of gathered up your papers and probably had started your report, sitting in your typical table in the corner of the three bells, when you're joined by uh, Silas from from upstairs and Medric, who comes in. Uh, probably looking pretty good. Uh, right. Not only had a bit of a clean, but also uh, you've had a, a, a religious moment. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to refer to leveling up as a religious moment from now on. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> um, and you gather and take a look at the oh. things that you have found. I'm presuming you're doing that. Yeah. Yep. So, <clears throat> I won't have specific quantities for some of these things, just because it really depends on what you need. Um, first of all, you did find a bag of diamond dust. You are able to confirm that it is, in fact, diamond dust that is in one of the bags. Uh, commonly wow. used as a spell component. Uh, the amount that's here would actually be a medium uh, money amount, which is a pretty significant haul. Um, but if you need it for um, spell components, I, I forget which ones you need. Um, Raised dead. Uh, you need a large diamond for that, I think. Okay. Uh, river for, uh, the level three I, one, Riverfy, uses, I uh, believe, 100 gold in diamond dust. Right. I don't so, know if I have access to that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. As a cleric, you would have Riverfy or access to it. Um, 
so I'm going to say that that's, that's uh, four uses for that. So effectively, it's for 100 gold uses, but it's medium wealth, which, depending on how you bargain, can actually be worth more, but um, that gives you access to that spell. Uh, you did pick up two repeating crossbows, which are basically incomplete and broken. Uh, nonetheless, they are pretty effective. Um, in uh, For those of the players, the repeating crossbow is in... Um, uh, D&D Beyond, there's still that bug where it's, I've opened it once, so I can't open it a second time. Um, yep, it's a, it's a feature. Yeah. Um, but essentially, in its broken state, it can still fire two bolts at the same time. They're small bolts uh, with a clip on the bottom. The clip holds six bolts in total. Um, with one attack action, you can fire twice with it. Um you found metal bolts, which are specifically sized for it. You can also get wooden bolts made. You could get metal bolts made as well, but they, they are custom built. They're smaller than a typical uh, bolt. Um, you make two attack rolls when you shoot. It's at the same target. It has to be the same target. On a weapon, on a one, however, roll, the weapon is jammed, and you have to clear the weapon, which in combat takes an action plus a roll. Uh, if you take 10 Can't minutes you outside of combat. Maintenance? Well, that is percussive maintenance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because there's two ways you can do it. You can do it with athletics or you can do it with sleight of hand. Athletics is more more uh, percussive maintenance. Sleight of hand is a little more uh, careful. Uh, it's harder to do the careful one. But it can be unjammed in combat. If not in combat, I assume that if you just take 10 minutes to do it, uh, you can un unjam it. Um, it is... Or the, it is a broken repeater just becomes a bludgeoning weapon. Like you can use it as a bludgeoning, basically a simple club at that point. It has a mechanism inside. The mechanism is, is a little bit broken, um, which you can mechanically fix this weapon. If you do, uh, it will actually get a bit better. It won't jam. Um, and if you, f if you find the appropriate crystal, um, which I've called an aiming crystal, um, which you'll have to research to figure out what that might be. There is an obvious spot f with uh, a magical incantation around it where a crystal is meant to go. And that will actually enhance the weapon and turn it into a magic weapon. So you're kind of aware of these features as you, as you examine it. Um, it, ha it is heavier than the sort of light crossbow of the same size. It also has the loading uh, ability, which means that Every time you fire it, you'll have to take another action to reset it to fire again. So it's a fairly slow weapon. Again, the mechanically fixed version removes the loading trait. Um, so it actually makes it faster as well. Um, is it one of the items you found? And again, that's in roll 20 for the players. You have two of them. So you can decide amongst yourselves who is uh, uh, going to carry them, if anybody. You don't have to use them. Um, you found a bottle of oil, which had small specks in it. And I think Silas actually tried to taste it uh, or take a drop of it before. Uh, I believe and, so. Yeah, and you found that it kind everything. of, it had a bit of, it had a, a bitter taste and it actually hurt your tongue a little bit when you did so. Um, that is actually oil of sharpness. Um, that can be applied to a weapon um, to increase its... Uh, uh, well, it, it turns into a magical weapon with a plus three bonus uh, to attack and damage. Nice. Um, the the application of the oil takes a minute, and it's, then it's coated for an hour. Uh, and then there are five uses within this, this bottle. Uh, so Silas was sharp-tongued. Essentially, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a really good session for puns today. <laughs> If uh, none of you have gout, I've had I've experienced with gout, and gout feels like an oil of sharpness shoved into a a, a, a bone. Don't lie. Um, no, it is not uh, not good. <laughs> um, you found a crystal charm, um, which has a uh, where are we here? Oh, did I close it already? Oh, there we go. Um, it is a chunk of crystal, roughly spherical in shape. It has been polished and shaped into the right space. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I thought it had a description of the look. Of the look. It does not. Uh, 
I just remember there's like Athlonian writing, writing on it. Right. Um, this is referred to as a scarn. Um, it is an item that does require attunement. Uh, it's, it's referred to generically as an orb of shielding. This particular one reduces damage coming in from acid and poison. Not surprising to have found that in a place with a lot of acid and poison. Yeah. Uh, basically, you, you uh, reduce, you use your reaction to reduce the damage by 1d4. Okay. Uh, no number of uses per day, but it does require a reaction to use. If you're looking it up on D&D Beyond or looking it up in uh, any of the books, uh, it's listed in the Wayfarer's Guide to Eberron as a uh, Kithrian Skarn, K-Y-T-H-R-I-N, yeah. Kithrian Skarn, or an Orb of Shielding. Okay. Uh, that one does require uh, attunement. Well, I will attune to it. So it, it reduces damage 1d4 from a which sources or all sources? Or? Uh, acid and poison. And it does require a reaction. Basically, a reaction to an incoming attack with that, that damage. Uh, the okay. small pearl you found when you first came in um, surprises you in its magical strength. And you realize, um, in fact, it would be Silas who realizes, that this is a pearl of power. Uh, it does require attunement by a spellcaster. While you have that pearl on the per on your uh, person, you can use an action to speak its command word and regain one expended spell slot. Nice. Uh, once per day. Um, Is there a size limit on that spell slot? Uh, uh, up to third level. Okay, then I can't use it very well. Um. Yeah, that's weird. I'll have to see, because that's in the basic rules. i have to see how that, that combines with Warlock stuff. Probably just doesn't. I think that's probably why the Warlock focus gets a reuse a spell slot. Fair. It's sort of their version. Um, I may change that or extend that then. Uh, you found a pair, uh, a bag of small rubies. Um, that is uh, a uh, too small money, essentially. It's not a full medium money. It's, about, it's, a, it's a larger bag than the bag of diamond dust, but diamond dust, first of all, is more more valuable per gram. Um, but these rubies were uh, clearly intended to fit into the uh, skulls of the mechanical rats you had run across. Uh, they were used, in that case, as a focus for their inbuilt um, gaze ability. You found a small pair of goggles, which you realize are indeed actually magical. And thus, if you attune to them, or actually, if you wear them, they will resize. That does not require attunement. Um, there's a small strap on the back that can be resized. Uh, they are eyes of minute seeing. Um, basically, they are zoom goggles. And they give you advantage on intelligence investigation checks with rely on sight when searching an area or studying an object within that range. Uh, range of one foot. Um, so that's going to be going to somebody who is dump status, not intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it makes sense to you because uh, he would have been working with small machines, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this was probably a backup pair or a different pair that he carried. Okay, Pearl Power. Sharpness, shielding. The clockwork amulet um, that you start to sort of, you feel it continuously ticking from within. Uh, and in fact, when you're holding it, you can feel the gears turning inside. Um, as you uh, um, are holding it, however, Silas, and starting to examine it, you start to realize that with every tick, there is a sense of what the future might hold. And if you are to, if you time it just right, you can predict very slightly what's going to happen next. So it is actually the list that is a clockwork amulet uh, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Uh, if you make an attack roll while wearing the amulet, you can forego rolling the d20 to get, get a straight up 10. Uh, that's used once per day. Uh, recharging at dawn. 
Is it only attack rolls or is it skill checks as well? Only attack rolls. Okay. But a ten feels like it was. It's a good bad. item. It, it's it's a solid it's a solid uh, opportunity to. Uh... I was just asking for the performance tonight. All oh, right. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> not. Be fine. Yeah. Unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, uh, that is a rogue ability. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you have a set of gnome-sized master tinkering tools, um, which are non-magical. Uh, they may have been forged with magic, but they do not actually have a, a magical quality uh, of their own. Uh, however, they are of high quality and actually are worth a medium money on their own. Um, or potentially more if you can find the appropriate buyer. Um, or you can use them. If you do use them, they're a little awkward, but they'll still grant you the necessary advantage. Uh, one thing that uh, do a very golden exchange for information. One thing that you golden notice, day. Annie, is while they are mm -hmm. different than your thieves' tools, because they are of diminutive size, they can actually be used as thieves' tools. Ooh, nice. And as mentioned before, you also had uh, a few handfuls and some larger blue crystal shards. Um, those can be used by a skilled alchemist. Uh, to brew, po brew potions of healing. Um, you do know that by simply shattering the crystal, uh, effectively letting its, its stored up magic pour over you, they can be used as immediate healing um, right then, but they are a lot less potent. The small ones, basically, uh, the handful. Um, go ahead and roll uh, 2d6 for me, uh, Annie. Determine exactly how many you grabbed in your handful. Uh, uh, for the tiny ones, they are 1d4 each. Seven. So you have seven 1d4 uh, blue crystal shards. Um, for the larger ones, they are 2d4. Um, and I think you grabbed medium-sized ones. I forget exactly who did that. Is that Medric or Silas, one of the two of you? Uh, Medric, I, I, got... I think, grabbed medium-sized. Silas grabbed one that was you said was the size of a baseball bat, but half the length. Right, right. Uh, that is 3d4 if used directly. Um, so it's a good it's a good momentary burst. I'm sorry. That's uh, 1d4, 2d6, 3d8. Uh, um, so they are pretty significant on their own, or they can be used either to brew broken down and brew smaller potions, or you suspect that Dr. Marigold can brew something a lot less ugly tasting than what he had uh, sewn into his shirt. Well, soaked into his shirt, really. So the medium, the, the medium ones I got are two d six, right? That's right. And how many did I have again? Seven d four of healing, which is you know. Yeah, great. that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I, I could have swore I wrote it down. And, uh, now I can't find it. I think it was two, but I could be wrong. If you have a written note, then we can go with the written note. Yeah, I think it was two mediums or a bunch of smalls, and you picked the mediums. Which, again, are good for a quick fix. They are, the small ones can fit easily in a pouch. The medium ones, uh, it's a little harder to carry them. And the large one, consider like carrying a weapon. You have to have a backpack or something or some way of strapping it to you. It's going to be pretty obvious. Okay. Is that a large blue crystal in your pocket or are you just happy to see a crowd <laughs> it's going to be staying home until i find a way to use it in something <laughs> that's the other thing too is these uh could be used to in other other ways if you come up with some clever uses potentially for them none of you happen to be alchemists but um you can always run it by dr marigold if there's other uses you think of yeah and um, i'm pretty sure dr marigold will be willing, will be willing to help us considering we just saved his ass <laughs> He certainly does owe you a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably more for he saving could Sandy. He'll be in that screen. <laughs> it's true. No, the spleen would be have emptied out at some point. They they would have vented exactly. the spleen. All right. So you take a moment to to examine the the treasures you found in your recent adventure. Discuss maybe how they might be used. 
And then the next thing on the major, on the docket, um, will be the performance the next night. So I'm going to assume, you know, the next day or so, Silas will go home at some point. Annie will make up that report at some point. Medrick will be staying at the temple at some point. We can just assume all that has happened and a long rest has happened as well. So you regained all your hit dice and your hit points and your spells and so forth. And you can also choose different up. spells if you have that capacity. And level up, yes. A religious experience. Your religious experience, your, your epiphany. <laughs> um, and then... I I play some darts and suddenly figure out how to throw three darts in six seconds. <laughs> um, or maybe two, take I some, say. maybe take some, yeah, take some, uh, some training on the the uh, repeating crossbow. Um, and I don't remember how many bolts you had found. You had found a number of bolts, metal bolts. Um, so you like, have those. I don't know like if I just wrote down or something. Because yeah. I cannot find anything. There is only one clip per um, per repeating crossbow, so you'd have to refill the clip after six shots. Yeah, I'm probably not going to use the repeating crossbow very much, so I can loan it to Anya in the meantime. Like, yeah, I I can. You can do the pew pew. Okay. <laughs> um, well, Silas would want to split these things up before we break for rest. Um, just thinking the oil of sharpness. I also get access to the hmm? also get access to the repeating crossbow. Bow. Oh, there it is. Never mind. You Dang should have it access all. to it on roll 20. Yeah, I, I just I was looking at it and not not reading it apparently. <laughs> Um, the oil of sharpness should probably go to Annie because she's the only one that really uses sharp stuff. Yeah. Oil of sharpness. Okay. Uh, okay. So what was? Oh, the crystal charm was acid and poison resistance. Yeah. The ticking watch was the uh, uh, the clockwork charm. Um. Okay. Uh, if the pearl uh, would actually work on Silas's warlock slots, then he would ask for that. But if not, it should go to uh, Medric. Uh, right for regaining spell slots. Yeah, you can get one back up to level three. The problem with my warlock slots is they're currently at level four. So it's actually a little more it. complicated than that. Um, if you spend a spell slot of fourth or higher, mm -hmm. you can regain a third level sl spell slot. Okay. Yeah, it's a little. So, yeah, weird. it's not. Yeah, so that wouldn't work for Silas then. So I should go to Medric. Got right. Thank you, Silas. Um, that one does require attunement. Okay, I can only attune to three things? That's yes. Right. Okay, so that's two things to now from this adventure alone. And does yep. Silas have resistance to acid and poison already? Or uh, Nope, but he's already got like four different things to attune to, so... Oh, okay. Uh, so you don't want well, the... He, uh, he is immune to poison fine. damage. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I already got that. So um, do you don't mind if I keep the uh, the charm? The scar? Okay. Or orb shield? Uh, what was it? Um, the clockwork uh, charm should probably go to one of you two. You guys attack more often than I do. Um, it would probably work best for Annie since she does one really heavy attack, so a 10 might be a good way to make sure it hits um, after your performance you tend right? to get someone out of trouble mm. well it attacks. wouldn't work for my performance it's okay. only attacks um uh silas yeah, would ask... yeah definitely 
Yeah, Silas would ask for the goggles and the tools because he does like, like with the goggles he made for Annie, he does intend on making stuff, but he doesn't actually have tools to do so. Um, so if that's okay with folks, then uh, yeah. Uh, the last thing is the, I mean, you guys can use the crossbows if you want. Uh, Silas is not strong yeah, and it's yeah. not really his thing. Uh, I mean, I'll keep and... one on me. I don't really use a crossbow. I mean, if you want me to carry one, I'll carry it. Um, do you mind if he takes the bag of rubies? Because he's got no money. Go for it. <laughs> and I think you guys are both richer than him. Um... I have a few money, but that's just because I've not spent anything. <laughs> mm. Yes, same. But Silas spent his last money on tickets for the uh, the circus. Yeah. Um. Um. What I will say is, I will mention about the, the potential use of those tools as thieves' tools in a pinch. Okay. Just if ever that happens. Sure. I imagine they're small enough he can probably keep them on him, so yeah, uh, they'd be around. While Basically, we're doing if my if mine do like break while we're doing something and we need to get into something, mm. or yeah. if it's a really hard law, if these give advantage, then uh, uh, they'd be useful to you. Yeah, they they do give advantage while you're using them. Okay, so. but maybe like. Maybe you keep them while we're out doing stuff, and Silas keeps them during downtime, because he only really needs them around. to work on stuff. So sounds like a plan. And you can imagine these having been rolled up in a leather pouch, essentially. Yeah. Um, we're in Annie's room, are we, or where are we? Um, I had set it up as you guys were just, were sitting downstairs in the main common room, but you can certainly. If you felt, you yeah, I'm privacy. good with either way. Um, well, I mean, it's not that something that has to be super secret, I suppose, but um, you'll say, I, I have a new gift from my matron. Oh, what um, is it this time? Tail that, like, well, that, <laughs> um, horns that could be quite useful to us. But it depends on your trust for me. I can certainly see how people might not trust it. Um, he pulls out the uh, the the darkened tome that uh, he occasionally is used. You see it all, pretty much always on him. And he opens it up to a page, and he says, mm -hmm. um, he says, in your mind's, you know how I talk to you like this? Mm -hmm. With this, if you are to write your name on this page, I can talk to you from any distance. Um, but Does I understand. It, uh, yes, basically, I can send a short message to you and you can send one back. Uh, in terms of game mechanics, it works just like the sending spell except it doesn't cost me a spell slot, but I can only use it with people who write their names on this page. Um, and are there any consequences to writing your name on the page that are that does not include the telepathic? No. That's all that it does. Okay. As far as you know. Uh, so he'll, he'll hold it out for if people want to, or if one of you wants to, and then the other wants to see what it, what happens then go ahead um but it's up to you guys wise i have this ring that prevents people from talking in my head if i don't allow it specifically sign this and then shit hits the fan and message to go through i'm pretty sure it would block it Wait. yeah yeah, it's like a magical of... appear offline button. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I will mention, uh, I can, uh, currently I can have four names in this. I'm thinking of uh, asking Dudek to put his name in here as well. That would let us communicate mm. with him while yeah. he's gone. And uh, what if yeah. that book falls into like enemy hands? What happens then? Uh, I can destroy it and make a new one. From a distance? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, sure then. I'll, I'll write my name on the book. It's... Um, Button. The book Annie, itself is a, a gift to me from my mate friend. Annie, uh, you can choose a, to either make an arcana or religion roll as you ponder the interactions of these magics. I'll do arcana. Okay. That's a 17. 17? Nice. Yeah. You know the item that you were gifted, the one that you wear, the ring, is very powerful. And there have not been anything that has been able to breach it so far. The question does come up in your mind, however, this is a contract with a god that you are signing. So, the ring should still hold. It is a contract with the universe. But gods have a way of stepping around contacts, contracts when necessary. You're not entirely certain which one would win but you have confidence the ring would at least provide resistance. Fair enough. Silas will look over at Medric in case he is. I'm leaning towards it, but uh, if I ever want my name off there, can I erase it? Yes. Is he lying? <laughs> nope. Uh, I don't think he's actively lying. He may not okay. realize whether you can do it or not, or whether mm -hmm. he has to do it. He knows he can do it, so. So, not lying. And he knows he knows that he would not stop you from, uh, er, he would not refuse to erase it, so to him, this is good. Oh, shit. Well, we'll let you ponder this for a moment. We will yes, reconnect our call. Go to the <laughs> and we'll be back in about five minutes. Okay. And we're back. We left off with the decision about whether or not the other two characters were going to sign their name in Silas's magic book. It sounded like they were more or less on board, but we needed a moment to think about it. Now... We're going to montage this next part. At what time is, of the day is it, roughly? Eh, montage. Okay. It's montage time. Montage time. <laughs> Unless there's something you need to specifically do at a specific time. No, I was going to cast Commune with Ignis, but only if it's like, only if I'm going to regain that spell slot bef like before the next big event. Because I would like to have, I would like to have Agnes's opinion about me signing this book. That's clearly for Mother Hydra. <laughs> okay, you can you can definitely uh, uh, perform that that evening. Yeah. So I will need to look up commune to remember what it does. I get to ask him three questions. I believe they have to be yes or no. Yeah. Yes, no, or... Hmm. Is this a good idea? <laughs> then just roll the Ignis 8, like Magic 8 ball, and yes, no. <laughs> awesome. kind of wish I had one right here. I would use it. Later. Uh, all right, yes. Contact your Dini or Divine Proxy. So where are you going to do this? When I'm back at the temple later, later on. Okay. So you do receive a correct answer, but unclear may be one of those correct answers all right all right so you find yourself uh, probably in the center of the temple all yeah, the flames after everything kind of... is closed down for the night sure everything is closed down but it's still bright as day probably inside the temple itself even yeah. without an ever flame all the little uh, uh, braziers and, and other things around still up uh, burning 
And as you you uh, you find yourself, uh, d how do you commune? Do you sit down in a, a cross-legged pattern, or do you stand? Do you uh, light up a, a, a bowl of fire and step into it? What do you do? I'll stand near the Everflame, facing it directly, probably a little too close than what people would consider, com would consider comfortable. And uh, I'm just kneeling, sitting on my heels, okay. eyes closed, feeling the flame, and... And you feel the flame. Not only are you aware of every single flame in the room, you can kind of, the, the, the sweet smell of the incense permeates, and you can kind of get the sense of, of everything that is burning, too. Not just the flame themselves, but the things being consumed as part of this process. And you can feel your own skin start to, to ripple and twist as, as you uh, know, even without opening your eyes, you know that you are yourself engulfed in flame in this moment. You know that you have the attention of Ignis. What do you ask? Is Mother Hydra directly opposed to you? Um, hmm. Or opposed to you in general? Well, you do have to depict the question. You can't just rephrase it. <laughs> it becomes two questions. Yeah, so, just, let's, let's just go with the first one. Okay, directly opposed? Um, you feel every muscle in your body ignite into flame. Uh, and it is a, a feeling of security, a feeling of the power of Ignis, the power that oversees all others. Uh, and the answer that comes to you is no. Okay. I'm normally more vague with these, but honestly, I don't have the energy right now. So there'll be a little <laughs> more direct answers. <laughs> Second question. Is it safe for me to sign my name on in Silas's book? Hmm. Let's see. The answer this time is all the other flames around the room burning uh, hotter and you don't see it because your eyes are closed but you know that if anyone were in the room their life would be in danger the flames Whoa. would have would have reached across the room but to you to you there's an absolute security of being here the center of ignis the eye is upon you and when the eye is upon you can anything truly be a threat and the answer is no so it's not safe to sign Silas's book? You asked if it was dangerous to, to sign Silas. I asked if it was safe. Oh, okay. Sorry. The answer would be, the answer would be, uh, essentially, it is no danger to you. Okay. Third question. Uh, I'm trying to, like, phrase this one in my mind. I, I, am I thinking these questions or asking them out loud? That's up to you. Okay, I will. I will think the question. Did Teraz Nakma Dwagaul challenge you in the past? Uh, the intensity of the heat in the room becomes even a little uncomfortable for you. It's almost as though now you feel yourself to be at the center of a sun. And you now feel and smell not only the incense burning and the simple things that were being consumed, the oils and the the, the woods that you were using to, to light the various braziers, but even the braziers themselves, even the hard ceramics and the, the stones that are used to uh, to hold these fires, they themselves are now almost subjected to a, the cleansing fire of Ignis. And it is with this sense of anger, of frustration, of uh, appalled, uh, uh, indignant reaction that you get a very clear yes. And I'll, before the connection severs, I'll make sure I tell Ignis, well, we'll beat him again. And in the instant when the connection is severed, it is almost as though all the flame goes out at once. And for that brief instant, you feel a chill, 
almost as if there is other powers displacing Ignis in the room. And when you open your, your eyes, however, you see that everything is still hot and burning practically. Uh, I would imagine that a Temple of Ignis doesn't have a lot of burnable materials intentionally, but to see the walls kind of blackened a bit by the flames which crawled across them just a moment ago um, still puts you a little bit perhaps in awe of the power of Ignis. And then as you stand up, as you, as you recover yourself, you do notice that the, ra- the rings of burning emanate starting from you. That while you felt the other fire in the room, it is as though you blazed as hot as the sun for a moment. Cool. I am the Everflame. No. <laughs> that would be a very likely a, a battle cry of the Kmar, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do I know if Agnes heard me say the part that we'd beat him again? Because I feel bad like having ended the call with him being offended. What does your faith tell you? God damn it. Well, if he's always with me, then he's always in my thoughts. Then yes, he knows that we will beat him again. There you go. Religious crisis solved. Hey. <laughs> Existential crisis. Medrick is like... Are you mad at me? Are you mad at me? (laughs) Dude, stop texting. (laughs) Uh, I like how that voice came from nowhere because you're currently frozen on my screen. So it's almost... Me or Pat? Oh, Pat. No, uh, Pat's currently frozen. Yeah, I'm looking all like focused. I know. It's like, it's like, (laughs) dude, dude, relax. (laughs) All right. Well, we are focused and relaxed as we... Sorry, go ahead. (laughs) Um, As we montage into the next day, and this essentially is your preparation phase. This is you're discussing what you're going to do, if anything. And this can simply be, Silas, you relate the the plans that you have uh, that you're going to do for your performance. Um, And it can be the others kind of deciding how they're going to be involved. I will tell you the other people listed. So a poster has gone up on the day of the contest uh, saying the competitors that are there. And there are, there are listed five names on that list, but um, you'll, you'll see in a minute why that may not be true. The first one listed is the Menagerie of Yestin Shah, I-E-S-T-Y-N, and a separate name, S-H-A-W, or S-H-A-H, I should say. The second one listed simply as the light show. The third one, listed as the knife dance of death. The fourth one, listed as so. What does Silas give a name to his performance? Uh, let's see. Where is that? The rising of the three, the phoenix champion and his allies, the shadowy mastermind and the sorcerer of the depths. You find it abbreviated to the rising of the three because it's not that big a poster. <laughs> Um, and finally the last one listed uh, and it says with special performance by D.D. Frock Hmm. which um, all of you can make a history check all of us sir Um, I have no idea that it's Dale. Nope, I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> frock. So am I seeing? I'm seeing a nine from from uh, Silas, a six from yep from Medric, and uh, I didn't see yours, Marie. Marie. What was it? Thirty twenty. There you go. Um, so actually, it's kind of appropriate in many ways that Annie uh, is the one to recognize the name. Uh, Dee Dee Frock is a well-respected and well-known uh, group, a performer, consisting of three people. They have toured the Capitol before, which is actually where you've seen, or maybe or maybe not, you haven't seen them, but you know they were performing there. Uh, two of them are two uh, ludists, uh, Rocky Cave and Gillum Monkey Paws, or two dwarves. 
and behind them sits uh, behind a an enormous drum set, a beardless gnome drummer named Sergio the Stash. Their music is unusual, heavy, and very very catchy. And yes, if you're wondering about the pun, uh, the their songs include "I Need Brew Tonight," "Gold Press Lamb," "Platinum Blackbird." I've got the picks. Show me your mine. DB's dinners. <laughs> Sleeping hag. Uh, Blue bean blues. Give me all your covens. Uh, La strange. Axe love and cheap picks pick axes. And if you're still not entirely certain, Rocky Cave is a representation of Dusty Hill. Kill a monkey paws is a representation of Billy Gibbons. And Sergio the Stash is a rep- representation of Frank Beard, otherwise known as ZZ Top. <laughs> I'm sitting on that pun for like a month. <laughs> Two, actually. <laughs> so, but they, and the, the way, as you look closer at the poster, you can see that there does seem to have been some paint over the line of number five, um, where it was painted over and then with special performance by Dee Dee Frock was written in afterwards. Can we try to make out what the former number five said? Mm, take a closer look at the poster, yeah. Uh, how are you going to do that? You, there is paint over it and the name over it. You could scrape the paint off potentially, but that would be obvious. Mm. Silas is going to put the goggles on and take a really close look at the... Nice. At the uh, there you go. The uh, thingy poster. Make, make an investigation roll. With advantage. This is, there's my character sheet. Uh, Woo! Not twenty. Hey. So nice. as you look as you look at it, uh, you kind of are trying. The the paint is kind of thick, but a little faded at points. Uh, and then as you flip the poster over. It's made of a, a sort of cloth. Uh, you can actually make out where the paint is soaked through on the other side. Uh, and it had. Um, Written on the back, uh, the the um, phrase or the, the the line, Dale's story song, but that seems to have been removed. Oh. I'd feel bad for him, but he's kind of a douche. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll let them know who it was. It's like, I mean, he was let out of jail so i mean maybe he left town or something i'm not going for another missing persons thing right now no we'll keep that in mind for the future though okay so how would you like to proceed Um, uh, if you need me in the audience, where do you want me to sit? I wouldn't want to sit in the very front because then ever I'll block everybody's view. I mean, kind of center back, maybe. Then everyone Sounds can look good. back at you. Um, he a he looks at Annie and says, "I don't know if you're planning on coming or not." Uh, I mean, I was I was gonna go. Cool. No, that's that's cool. Uh, I'm trying to help I, if you need me to help. Um, what would you like to do? <laughs> he said that mostly this is just it's going to be a musical and spoken word like performance, like an epic poem recalling the things that we've done. Um, I mean. Uh, Um, it's, up, it's up to you. I do have a good performance. You end up performing. It's something that I'm good at. Mm. Uh, so. I mean, is it mostly what I'm going to be doing is one of my illusion shows. 
Uh, I've got a better version of the spell now. Um, oh, they do announce what the prize is. Uh, and the prize will be uh, in the take of the door. Uh, will be four small, three medium, and two large money. Um, so it's a rather significant prize, plus a guitar of illusions. Oh. Mm. And now Silas is like, <gasps> must have. Mm. Wanted one, couldn't get it. Um, so he looks up at Annie and suddenly looks a little conspiratorially, like he's got a plan. Um, how about this? What if you were to... Uh, like, I'll be controlling the lights. What if you were to be moving around and occasionally showing up uh, in the crowd as the shadowy mastermind, like clashing your blades together or something like during the, the fights? Uh, bringing it out, basically, like bringing it out into the audience. You have a very good ability to pop up places. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you could say things as well if there's something appropriate to the moment. Uh, Act uh, it out, kind of. Yeah, like sort of suddenly appearing and uh, uh, clash of blades as the bad guy is taken down, uh, or possibly like you're very good at this, so I doubt there'd be a problem. But like possibly throwing like a dagger at the illusion of the bad guy uh, during a fight. Um, I can have it react to stuff like that. I think it might be not do that type of thing in the crowd. Yeah. Maybe have that happening. Yeah. Sure. Safer. <laughs> I trust you either way. Like having it acted out behind you, basically. Mm hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, if there's, if there's anything else that, that, uh, he'll mention that, uh, the specific parts he's going to be talking about are, uh, the lighthouse attack, uh, the sea devils, the machine in the sewers, not mentioning Regalesta, um, the flight of the titan's arm uh the hungry knolls in the forest and ending up with uh, clockwinder and what uh what uh, finding uh marigold and sandy um i mentioned a uh, cedar point ridge because that's kind of a current events <laughs> um it'll probably show it some yeah but uh uh, basically, it'll be about that last uh, fight that we did where we were searching for Sandy and, and Marigold. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so for, basically, so like... to give you a bit of structure, um, you'll have 10 rounds to achieve your goal. Each of those 10 rounds will have some action, some role to do it. And I would, just, I would expect that for each of those 10, it's one element of your story. So if you can take your your stories and just sort of go, these are the 10. We'll go through them that way. Four, five, six, seven. Uh, including the beginning and ending bits, I've got eight. Okay. Um, and they can be actions or other things in the middle as well. Yeah. But since you have so many story well, bits. Well, scenes. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, Round it up to 10. <laughs> um, he said, I'm also going to see if maybe Marigold uh, and Verendel will come to see it as well. So we've got a couple of people in the audience that I can point to who were involved at certain points. Um, again, audience participation tends to, tends to go big. So uh, the more we can get this happening sort of in and around the, uh, the crowd that's there, the better. In the montage of all of this, um, Verendel is absolutely going to be there, was already planning to be there 
anyway. Uh, Marigold declines uh, in part because he's still investigating Dolver. Yeah, that works. Sure. Um, and uh, um, we'd mention it to Sandy as well in case she wants to show up. Yeah, all uh, three of the bells are going to be there with bells on. You might cool. Say. I was going to, I uh, saw this one that he was going to ask Jonas to come by, but he kind of forgot. And I think it's a little late to have like a messenger ride all the way to the lighthouse and them come back. So maybe next time. Um, and during the montage, Silas will go to Dudek uh, and present the option of signing his name in the book. And we can, uh, we can, uh, well, at least Silas can open communication uh, that way. Um, Annie will sign the book once she finds out that Silas can remove her name from the book. Yeah, Medrick will sign the book too. Yeah, and Silas will show them too. Like he'll get them to sign twice. They'll they'll sign once and then he'll erase it, and then they can sign again. So that he can show them that yes, it it can be removed. So when you sign the book. There is a visceral reaction. You can feel this connection. It it doesn't last strong for very long, but when you do it, there is sort of a, a little thin wisp of silver that forms from the word to you, and you're aware of that presence. It fades after a few seconds, but it definitely feels that you have, have bound yourself to this book, which is exactly what Silas told you it would do. But it's a little bit more visceral, perhaps, than you were expecting. It's not just a, a simple signing on a piece of paper. But he is able and to Silas will, it. Silas will actually test it, too, and say, it's like, testing, testing, can you hear me? Over. So who do you do that first? Uh, Marie mentioned it first, so I, I'd say yeah. Annie first. Okay. Um, and Annie, he'll show that basically he's writing it into the book. And then when she responds, she'll see it appear as writing. Okay. Annie, you do hear a voice in your head with the words that were written on the paper. It takes you a moment to realize it's Silas's voice because it's thick and almost alien to you. The voice sounds as though it is spoken by a serpent. Weird. But I hear you. Huh. Interesting. I'm not used to hearing my own voice, so. Um, and yeah, he'll do the same thing with uh, with Medric after. Yeah, like whenever we meet up or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then he'd go to uh, Dudek. And, Make a uh, again, simple persuasion. Option. Make a simple persuasion and roll for Dudek. He's immediately intrigued by the notion. Hey! You got the net 20s today, Pat. Uh, no, that... Uh, yeah, that I just was the wrong one. Out. He's immediately uh, intrigued right. by the by the notion, but he needs to do his own research before he'll agree. Well, that's fair, because I guess Annie and I also did the same thing. But... <laughs> sure. Uh, not unexpected, uh, but... Uh, um, actually, I would say, uh, come to the show tonight. I'm putting on a show. Uh, let me know there because we'll have to do it before you leave, if you're going to do it. I will indeed. Sounds intriguing. You can get to know us better through pop culture. <laughs> Wait, does that mean Dudek's going to see all the memes we send each other, like, telepathically? Well, this <laughs> this works like sending, so it would just be one-to-one -one person. Yeah, I was just he, he wouldn't be able to do group chats, sadly. Maybe an upgrade. Yeah, see, it's not it's not a a, a book of faces. It's a book based <laughs> on his faith. So really, it's just a faith book. Okay. <laughs> but I'm I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> the puns, the puns. Uh, you're right. muted, Pat. Uh, I think that's everything, really. Uh, he'd do a bit of practicing. Um, uh, he might do a bit of practicing just walking around the streets, also telling people that uh, there will be a, 
a show later tonight uh, with a new verse added to the song after a recent adventure. Okay. Doing a little you know, bit when, of hyping. When Medrick signs the book, like, I'm assuming it's just me and Silas, like, in the book, in the area. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be... I mean, it probably doesn't look like anything super weird, but uh, yeah, if, if you want it to be private, that could be private. No, I just want to tell you, uh, as my connection to Ignis grows and becomes deeper and deeper, I was able to actually talk to him last night. I found out that Mother Hydra and Ignis are not opposed, and that it's safe to sign the book. And I'll sign the book as I say that. Wow, and I also asked him. Surprise me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I when... also asked him um, if he who shall not be named had opposed them in the past, and the answer was a lot of anger and a lot of fire. So that's a yes. Hmm. If we ever need more tips, or I'm slightly jealous of your ability to just reach out and talk to your god. Mine doesn't quite work that way. Um, Although you reflect on the fact that it actually has worked that way, and you physically manifested your god before. Oh, I have, but not, <laughs> but not by command. It's true. He's tried it several times, and it just hasn't worked at all. When uh, um, when Medric and Medric signs... bites back the comment like that's because um, Magnus is a real god. That I, I don't say that, <laughs> <laughs> but I did think it though. <laughs> um, was was. Was Silas listening to his brain at that time? No. Um, wait, wait, the response is being written right there on the page in front of me. Oh, wait, it's already working. Backspace, backspace, backspace. <laughs> Mental backspace. <laughs> so when Medrick signs the book, um, there is a, a black smoke that rises from the, the ink as your name is written into the book. And it, you realize at that point it is no longer being written into the book. It is burned into the book. And in fact, Silas, you experience a little discomfort. Um, it is almost as though he is he is burning this onto your skin. But the name is very definitely there. Um, and mm. the sense that you get from it is is the he wasn't so much putting his name to the book as Ignis was forcing it to be there and making it his will rather than just Medric's action. He does remove just like the others, but okay. there is that slight discomfort as as uh, the the sort of impression you get is um, Ignis kind of holding his hand and saying, "We're doing this, but we're doing this on my terms." Cool. Admittedly, not unexpected. This is Ignis we're talking about. It's true. All right. Oh. And that's basically all he's got that day. So, any not sure if it's the um, or the name itself also designs like her actual first and last name, and like seven or eight middle names, or no? <laughs> no, just, not 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 all of the middle names, ju just the first and last. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I did want to ask not... you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, Silas is not actually certain if it has to be your true name or the name you use or whatnot. That's interesting. Uh, if if Medric tries to sign, yeah. If if Medric tries to sign Midric, it does not work. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, my tax evading cousin, uh, Annie. Once more, the full name that you write in is. Oh, I I, I just write Annalise Montrose. I don't I I don't write all of the names. That that's that's fine. Not. It's like, okay, so I, I don't have any page for that. <laughs> Way to go. Wait, what was it? The the signer of the Declaration of, of Independence who had this n massive signature? Uh, one side. John. Crap. I don't remember his name right now, but yeah. yeah. I remember a yeah, wonderful sketch that, you... that, was, that was done about that. It's like, oh, come on, John. You took up half the page. <laughs> so. so, uh, yeah, and. When you sign the book, uh, Annie, you sign the book. Seems like a normal transaction. Yep. Uh, but you do um, feel that silver I will, thread. In montage time, I will drop off the... Uh, uh, I am quite detailed. Um, I do mention that... that 
this is part, all part of the same situation being the gems that we found are sim are the same as the gems that we found with the weather contraption thing that we stopped situation. The tunnels themselves were very similar to the tunnels we found in the arm that was affecting the water spout. And as well as like the main events of like what what went down what prompted the, the the searching the reactions basically okay um make a hmm let's call this a nature roll that's a natural 19 nice. 20. nice and lots of lots of dirty and natural 20s tonight one thing you realize as you are writing your report, um, Annie, and you can choose to share this or not, that's up to you. Uh, the, in the case of the arm, as you think back to that one, um, there was the, uh, the external effect of the whirlpool on the water that was there created by the arm's presence. In the case of the other, of the organ, in particular the last one you were in, um, there were those side tunnels that appeared to be not of the same chitinous material that the internal space was made of, but in fact seemed to be dirt and rock and stone, and that's where the crystals were found. Um, which suggests to you that um, those were breaches in the surface of that thing. They were not part of that thing. So when that thing took off, it may have left those parcels behind, or those spaces behind. something to maybe look into indeed so in the stomach so all right are there any other things that you'd like to discuss before we go into the the performance itself not for me no oh i almost forgot uh the uh silas does uh have nikki sign the book can you have that many yeah, yes, I have up to four. And uh, okay, he'll show Nikki what it's like, and uh, he'll also let his parents know that uh, he can speak to Nikki from a distance now. So if Nikki does something that's very out of left field, uh, that's probably from him. Okay. I like turtles. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it was, could be out of, out of left field for numerous reasons. Um, Nikki's handwriting is not that great yet. Um, I forget exactly how old Nikki is. He's six, I think, at this point? Maybe five? Um, uh, yeah, I think he's like four or five. Yeah, so it, it's a bit of a scrawling thing, but he does uh, does get his name there. And uh, he kind of giggles with joy and kind of chases at the little silver wisp when it appears. Uh, it stays longer for Nikki than for the other two, or the other three. That makes or, sense too, actually, because Dudek hasn't signed yet. Yep. Um, but he just sort of looks at the book. Um, he starts flipping through the pages, starting to point to different things that are in the pages. Sure. It kind of looks That's up with, you as, with, with serious, curious eyes every once in a while. Every time you explain something, he kind of laughs in that knowing way. Hee hee hee. Burn everything. <laughs> hey, that's my line. No. <laughs> Drown everything, Daddy. Drown everything. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Nikki pats his head. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, sorry, that's the only other thing I forgot there. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, I think we have enough time to continue for the moment. Let's see if I can. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh. All the things are destroyed. There we go. <sighs> Technology. Sounds anyway. Good. Glitch in the matrix. <laughs> um, yeah, glitch in the matrix. Exactly. Exactly. The universe shifted to the left a little bit. Now we're back. All right. So it is being held in the large main tent. They've had a number of different demonstrations and events and uh, some, some uh, uh, animal walkthroughs. They've had a kind of a circus, but the room is practically full. Uh, in some ways, it looks almost as though this 
This uh, is the entirety of the town and more are here. Now, you do know of a few people like Dr. Marigold and uh, the unfortunate souls that are taking care of the three bells tonight. Yes, all three of the bells are there in attendance in the front row. Um, they're kind of keeping Sandy no between the two other sisters, almost protectively, <laughs> a hand on her at all times, almost as if they're worried she could vanish at any second. Um, the, uh, the Barker, oh shoot, I don't have his name here, um, is the same Barker that did the haunted house. I have to find his name. I don't have to find his name, but I'd like to find his name. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Is it the beholder what? in the bow tie? Uh, like, one of the side bits like I'm going to add is about our adventures at the uh, at the uh, the haunted house. So uh, he'll be nice to have yeah, on, on the fly edition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, I have the whole circus here. I should bring up the whole names. Uh, circus Maximus. So Maximus is in attendance. Um, but isn't the one, uh, doing the individual, uh, sort of announcements that is, oh, uh, the gnome Willoweth the Mysterious, uh, with the slick backed hair, the handlebar mustache, uh, the, uh, stove type, uh, stove pipe hat, which is half the height he is. And a rather uh, elaborate coat. He's changed his coat to a one that's got small little, uh, looks like gems all throughout it. And it glows and glitters constantly. And he has this megaphone he speaks through. But then introduces, or welcomes everyone there. Again, Maximus does an initial welcome, just sort of uh, uh, let, the, let the games begin. Uh, but in part, uh, he claims because of the need to have some independence in the judging, he'll step back from the process and let uh, the other announcer uh, do the work. Um, and announces the first of the acts for the evening, the Menagerie of Yestin Shah, and encourages everyone to, to, to clap. No one, there are some claps in the audience, but no one knows Yestin Shah and has no idea what this is all about. You can get that sense from the crowd that th this is an unknown quantity. Silas, kind will of, clap, uh, uh, Silas will clap and try to sort of get everyone else to clap. It's like, okay, golf clap. Build up the energy. Sure. The, uh, um, performer. Make, a, make a persuasion check, just a sort of general group persuasion check. As you try to hype the crowd. I'll also be clapping. 14. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, we'll say it's an advantage because you have your friends kind of helping you pipe, uh, pimp okay. it up. So 23. 23. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things that once the people that know you start to clap and see you kind of enthusiastically clapping, it starts to spread around the, the, the audience until you're very happily hearing this sort of raucous uh, clapping going around. Medrick yeah. just stands How up. How do you know? Clap. Yeah, everybody. Medrick right. is just like casually clapping because nothing. <laughs> like I'm finally relaxing. Nothing bad's gonna happen tonight. I'm <laughs> good, uh, Mister. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and from the back, there's it's kind of a large stage that's up about uh, three feet off the ground. It's it's a temporary stage they've erected, but it's it's solid and sturdy, made of wood. And there's a, a back part which has a curtain which uh, covers that. Um, Silas, you want to say something? Uh, yes, I almost forget. Uh, Gideon's with me. No, oh, okay. Gideon Actually, is, Nikki's is... going to Nikki's going to be there too. Okay, your parents are probably here actually um, to to look after uh, Gideon uh, or look after uh, uh, Nikki. Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> They leave Nikki to run around, and they start. They're just petting the uh, chasing the, the flying bird. snake. Yeah. Um, no, Nikki's kind of excitedly uh, clapping around, and and you get the impression that where you were kind of clapping and trying to get others to clap, and and Nikki on your shoulders is just sort of enthusiastically clapping. You do notice that his 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 gaze kind of goes from one person to the next to the next, and kind of as they catch the eyes, they start clapping even more. Um. <laughs> a little creepy, but hey. Yeah, we have a, a, a cat break in the background. Um, 
and uh, the, the clapping kind of continues for a while, and it's a little bit uncertain how long it should go on, but it kind of holds on for a little while until the curtains part. And stepping out through the curtains is a rather tall, very hairy-looking figure dressed in, in layers of uh, cloth that seem to be stitched together from different pieces. They all leave, seem a little bit drab and dreary and very much hand-spun. They're, they stand uh, probably about seven feet tall, but they're a little bit hunched over at the shoulders. And the face is broad and covered with hair uh, with a large ridge line and a very broad nose. Um, you've seen fear bulg before, but they are not very commonly seen uh, in this area. But indeed, it is a fear bulg who's walking out kind of a bit slowly, a little older. You can see the, the fur is starting to gray a little bit in different places. Uh, large bovine ears as well that are kind of uh, calmly moving forward. And they seem to be almost exuding this level of calm. A few titters of laughter uh, come from the, the audience around as people are kind of taking in this odd figure moving very, very slowly. Um, for, for Annie who, to catching up, a, a, an old fear bulg has stepped onto the stage. Uh, a, a, a people you are familiar with, but they are not very commonly seen. Uh, and kind of walks out uh, to the, the center of the stage and kind of looks out with uh, large eyes at everyone around, very calmly kind of taking things in and nodding to themselves. And by now, the, the, the crowd's uh, clapping has died down, and there's a little nervous laughter as, as in, what, what's going on here? Uh, and they, they kind of move back to the center of the stage, having stepped up to look and move back. And from an enormous, uh, 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 or rather a small bag at their hip, they start pulling things out. And they look like small tambourines, uh, each one about six inches across. They're round. They've got little bits of, of, um, of metal on the sides that rattle. And they start placing them around the stage. Uh, and this whole proceeding is taking a couple of minutes, and people are starting to get a little bit uh, bored, almost a little bit uncertain. There's some jokes being uh, being thrown around the ca around the the crowd. Uh, someone, in fact, does moo because the fear bog have a resemblance sometimes to cows, and and kind of slow moving as well. They don't seem to notice. Yeah, the next to Medric. Uh, they're not too far away. Okay. And then the. Let's say, hey, that's racist. Um, they, they look, they look cocky, then look around and see who said it. And then you sort of uh, cringe a little bit and turn away. And, and it's like the whole, oh, it wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> um, but after setting out, uh, six of these in kind of a rough semicircle on the stage, um, they kind of, um, put that, that bag away and then reach kind of into their their robes, the ragged robes that they're wearing, and pull out another bag. This bag looks very different. This bag looks like it was made out of some sort of brown fur, uh, a very fluffy brown fur, and starts to pull out from this bag. Uh, reach deep into the bag, and let's have some D8 rolls. Can I have a D8 roll starting with Annie, please? Five. Um, wow, these are bigger than I thought. Okay, well, fine. They're bigger than I thought. Uh, reaches into the bag, and you can see uh, him kind of struggling a little bit. And as they pull out from the bag, which doesn't look all that big, it looks like this, this sort of rough sack, uh, pulls out and uh, almost attached to their hands by two enormous claws, uh, they pull and pull and pull as this large black panther emerges from the bag and kind of steps out onto the stage and kind of lands. And there's a, there's a shock that comes from the crowd and a little bit of fright. Uh, Sandy and her sisters kind of give a little bit of, actually not Sandy, the other two sisters give a little squeal. Sandy uh, kind of looks, oh, it's a cat. <laughs> um, let's have a D8 from, uh, from, uh, Medric, please. A eight. Eight. Okay. Um, this time, uh, uh, Shah puts the bag down and puts both hands in and seems to be grabbing and wrestling with something. And the first thing that emerge are these enormous, uh, tree branches 
or at least they look like tree branches until the head emerges and you realize it's a, it's a rack of a large giant elk is pulled out and stands uh, beside them on the other side, eyeing the panther, but also kind of seeming to be calm. Again, there's a bit of confusion, some laughter, and now a few claps going up in the crowd. And a D8 from, uh, from um, Silas, please. Two. Two. Uh, this time, uh, the uh, Shah reaches in all the way to their shoulder and reaches around, seems to rummage around for a bit, makes a, a funny face that a few people laugh at, and you kind of get the impression, performer to performer, the face was intentional. The face was meant to be kind of silly. The tongue kind of lolls out to one side, and finally there's a, a, a jerking motion as they reach in and pull out what looks like a giant rat. About the size of a, a mastiff dog. These are huge. Uh, and pulls that on the stage. And then there's a bit of applause as people are assuming, wow, that was an amazing trick. What a wonderful trick. From another pocket inside of their, their jacket, uh, they pull out uh, an enormous set of pan pipes and just blow each, each note of them at the, at the moment uh, and then start to play a, a tune. Thank you. So I'll, I'll wrap this one up quickly. Uh, start to play a tune. And as the tune plays, the three animals start to pace around them. And then in time with the tune, start to hit the, uh, the tambourines that are around the stage. And at first, it's this weird sort of cacophony, a, a sound of a, of a flute-like thing. Every once in a while, the occasional stomp, stomp, clash, clash, stomp, pad, stomp, stomp. And then it starts to speed up, and the animals start to, to canter around the stage. The whole stage is starting to bow a little bit under the weight of these animals. And you can also see that Shah's foot is starting to tap a little bit, uh, keeping a time and kind of getting a rather, rather, rather regular rhythm. And now the entire crowd is starting to clap around, uh, clap along, having sensed this rhythm. Uh, and uh, they will try to... Uh, do I have Shah here in front of me? I do. Uh, they will try to do their performance role. Uh, actually, sorry, their animal handling role. Um, oh, it's not going to come up for me. All right, so... Uh, as their attempt. And it is an advantage for them. Whew, okay. Um, and the, the whole thing starts to come into... Uh, into uh, a, a regular rhythm and it starts to crescendo. And again, people are kind of enjoying this strange thing of this, this, this person in the center of the whirlwind. Um, and then the rhythm starts to go wrong. There's a missed note on one of the tambourines. Uh, another tambourine seems to get hit by the side of the, the hoof of one of the, uh, of the, the massive, uh, uh, uh elk, uh, and skitters halfway across the stage. All three of you can make perception checks. Right, I actually have perception on this. Where the fuck is my character sheet? <laughs> my character has perception, not the player. <laughs> make an investigation uh, check for your sheet. Uh, yeah. Six was that? Oh boy, okay. I got a 19. Oh, I'm, I'm no longer playing a character who sees everything. It's fine. Right. Well, apparently everybody else sees everything. It's absolutely fascinating with this performance. For you, Annie, uh, what is it that distracts you about this performance? Why is this performance so appealing to you that you don't notice anything else? This note probably, like, make, like the clash makes me jump, probably, and my eyes close. Okay. Um, med, uh, let's start with uh, Silas. Silas, you notice that these animals themselves seem to be rather surprised that they're missing. Uh, they are probably well-trained or at least well-coordinated by Shah in the middle. Uh, and so they seem to be surprised by the fact that they're missing. And for you, uh, uh, Medric, you notice that when that, uh, that um, tambourine was missed, mm -hmm. um, you saw it move just before the hoof actually contacted with it. It moved out of the way, and then it was contacted and skittered away. I'll tell. So, uh, I'm assuming Annie and Silas are sitting next to me. I'm assuming you want to be seen with them. Yeah. 
I'll tell, like, I'll lean towards Stylus' side. Uh, yeah. That tampering move. Somebody's fucking with the show. Be mm, careful. As, as they attempt to, to recover okay. and try to regain the, the momentum, they actually slow the, the pace of the song down. And uh, the the elk tries to compensate by going out further to tamp on it, but it's no longer in the right rhythm, the right place for it to hit at the right time. And so the, the performance kind of winds down uh, to, to uh, a, probably, probably a lot quicker. As you could, you were sensing, especially you, Silas, you were sensing some of the changes in the music that were coming up. They were definitely building up to something and building up to some complex interchanges. And it's a pretty sophisticated piece in the end. Uh, but Shaw kind of slows it back down and then eventually just kind of brings it to a, a little bit of an abrupt halt. Um, and then for the last part, uh, actually holds the small bag out first towards the rat. No problem. The rat runs towards it, jumps in, uh, gets inside the bag. It's of the right size. Then holds it towards the panther. The panther, you can see, makes a running jump at it and extends its arms out in front so it just barely makes it through. Then everybody looks towards expectantly the, the large elk, who is clearly larger than the bag. And the elk starts to paw at the ground. And uh, there's a bit of a moment of, of laughter. Shaw kind of shrugs, holds out the bag, and turns their face away towards the crowd, almost as if they're they're com comedically kind of uh, uh, um, uh, comedically signaling that this is going to be uh, a problem. Kind of wincing a little bit, but again. It's, it's a little bit cartoonish. It's a little bit uh, understandable. Yeah, kind of exactly like that. And then the elk charges. Uh, all three of you can make perception nice. checks once more. 22. Five. Holy crap. Pair of natural 20s. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you just broke the RNG. That's amazing. That's amazing. As all of you watch, and maybe with a little bit of tension, because this is a little bit weird, uh, as the thing starts to run fast, and it's basically gone to the edge of the stage, and it's running as fast as it can, and an elk can hit a pretty high speed. It lowers its head uh, to, uh, to uh, present its horns. And just as it moves and jumps... Um, all three of you notice as Shah's left arm jerks suddenly, pulling the bag off to one side. Fortunately, they seem to be strong enough with their other hand that they're able to hold the bag open and the elk goes diving and seems to fold back into the space where the bag was before. But all three of you noticed that peculiar, peculiar jump. You may, not have, you may have been the only one to notice as everybody else was staring at the elk at that moment. But uh, uh, looking a little bit, um, a little bit wide-eyed, perhaps more than just the play at the at the moment that they had a moment before, uh, Shaw takes a bit of a of a of a of a, 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 a gulp, takes a deep breath, and then bows to the very ecstatically res responding crowd as uh, people are amazed at this this display. Silas looks around to see if there's anyone with a especially smug or shocked look in their face. He's trying to see who's doing this. Make an insight check uh, with this advantage, though, because it's a large crowd. Yeah, Medrick will do the same. Okay. Again, with this advantage. With insight. disadvantage, a six instead yeah. of the natural 20. That's a lot of natural 20s today. I'm sad to see that one go. There's an 18. I rolled below a 10 the, uh, for both, 18 so uh, I'm, I don't notice. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, Annie, perhaps there was a bit of the moment which you were caught up in and kind of don't think to look around for anyone. Silas, you're looking around and there are a number of people who are like, they look disappointed. They were kind of hoping for a big, terrible splash at the end, but they look like the kind of people that were always looking for that kind of big, terrible splash at the end. You're probably going to have to watch out for them during your performance as well, because they'll be mm -hmm. expecting something to go wrong. Uh, Medrick, uh, you see, um, let's see, um, you see someone, uh, looking up at the stage, um, with some satisfaction, but clapping along like everybody else, 
but there is a sort of uh, look of annoyance as if they weren't expecting them to do as well as they did. Uh, it looks like, from your perspective, a short person, um, they've got a hood over their, their face, um, kind of thin. Uh, the hood looks kind of ragged and worn, uh, cloak and hood, uh, as you uh, as you kind of look over in that direction. I'll point um, them out immediately to Silas and Annie. It's like, that guy over there, he's sketch. Um, they fade into the crowd, kind of having noticed some attention, and then just sort of back, back away into the very thick crowd. We're going to need to uh, break for a moment at this particular moment. We'll be back in about five minutes. So first performance BRB. has done. And we're back in the midst of the first of the performances of the night. But, Medrick, you've just spotted someone who seems to be less than pleased with the outcome. And then they vanished into the crowd. I'll tell Silas and Annie to watch out because they'll probably be back. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah, they're probably trying to spoil the other acts for someone in specific. Must be one of the two coming up because I think the last one's not participating this way. And I yeah. certainly didn't hire them. <laughs> I mean, whoever's performance goes flawlessly. Yeah. Well, uh, as you're there kind of looking around and losing track of where they might be, hundreds of people surrounding you all looking in the same direction, no one seems to have noticed besides the three, all three of you have noticed. Um, as the, is, uh, the uh, Willoweth, the mysterious, comes back on stage once again, encouraging everyone with a round of applause for uh, Yeston Shaw, uh, now uh, uh, kind of looks uh, and and. And does this this mysterious wiggle with their mustache? It's an amazing amount of lip control to be able to wiggle their mustache that way. But they're looking at the crowd with this with this uh, this moment of anticipation uh, about this incredible act from right here in Eothvater, no further than the edge of town, to be precise. Welcome, the light show. And the, the curtains part once more. Again, the, the enthusiasm of the crowd, having already been spurred on both by your own uh, efforts as well as the previous act. Uh, and now you see the, the crowd part. And indeed, uh, outstepping from the crowd or from the back, uh, two of the two adults who seem to be pulling a cart, which is covered with some sort of weird, uh, uh, I'll say pot. Uh, it's it's probably about three feet wide. Uh, it looks like it has a whole lot of holes in it and different spikes and different things on the center. Uh, and they're kind of wheeling this out. It's a low, low cart. Uh, and, and, enjoyed by, and, and joined by two kids, all of them wearing what looks like uh, to be some sort of glittery robe. And at first you don't recognize until uh, stepping out eagerly to the front is little young uh, Henry, who walks over to the uh, walks over to Willoweth, and uh, there's a little conversation. Then Willoweth, looking amused and surprised, hands over uh, his uh, megaphone to little Henry. Nice, they are here. <laughs> nice. uh, as now you realize that Henry is the, the 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 young boy there. Esri is the is the girl, the taller girl who's walking out front, and Jonas and Harriet are the ones on either side of this strange device. Oh crap! Cool. He's going to laser us with the thing. Um, and uh, um, are they using the starstone by any chance? <laughs> uh, you actually do sense the presence of starstone energy. Oh hell! <laughs> Hopefully, nothing goes sideways. Um, but it's very, very minimal. No one else would notice it except someone so attuned to it as you are. Uh, as uh, uh, with a, a, a supportive nod from uh, her mother. Uh, Esri steps to the front and kind of clears her throat. She looks terrified to be on stage at this point. Obviously, she's there at the encouragement of her of her parents and her younger brother. She's about. We cheer. Um, go ahead and make make a, a a supportive type role if you want to if you want to specifically uh, help them because uh, Henry definitely needs or Esri needs it right now as she Persuade. goes. To 
She's got this. Okay. Yep. Nice. A 22. Uh, so, yeah, you kind of uh, call out and whistle and, and uh, Ezri kind of looks and locks in on your on your, your the source of the sound. Takes a deep breath. And as she's about to say something, there's a loud blatting sound that comes from the megaphone as Enri maybe missed a cue or maybe he's warming up or something. It sounds kind of like the, the, a loud war horn that he's trying to emulate. And uh, she looks a little reddened in the face. The, the crowd generally, uh, generally uh, laughs and titters a little bit. Uh, you can hear, because you're so close to the stage, Jonas kind of call over, not yet, not yet. And a uh, big sigh from Henry. As uh, the, 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 maybe the tension was broken a little bit by that. Maybe it's the support that uh, she got from, from uh, uh, Annie up front. Ezra turns back to the crowd and begins. As I was about to say, this is an old story. Older than me, even older than my grandfather. Maybe even as old as, and she kind of makes this awkward gesture, kind of the pantomime, but she's not really a practiced pantomime. Older as this entire land. This is the, sta the tale of one of the oldest knights of the realm. And uh, it is a very old, old uh, story. The name of the knight themselves is, is lost, except for the, the, uh, the, the solitary soldier is one of the tales. In fact, Annie, you recognize the story. It's one of those legendary stories. It's one of the training stories that uh, Sir Conrova told you. The, the weapon master knight of Alaria, one of the people you trained with, she used this as a sort of a training tale, and she had phrased it and, 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 and structured it that way. The tale comes a bit differently from Ezri's telling, um, as it is a, a, the, the tale of a solitary soldier defending an entire town in a valley against a horde of hill giants using uh, tactics, wit, and their strength to, uh, over, uh, to overcome them. Um, Ezri at regular, uh, sorry, Enri at regular, uh, 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 points uses the megaphone and his own mouth to provide sound effects, not all of which are necessarily appropriate or accurate at that time, but every Wonderful. single one of them seems to get the, the crowd laughing. Uh, even Just at many points, Henry beatboxing kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a little, there's, it's, uh, it, he gets kind of told by, uh, by Jonas not to, to sing. Uh, and, but as they, as, uh, Esri lays out the beginning of the story, um, she says, but I'm not going to just tell you the story. We're going to show it to you. And she kind of looks over and nods to her father who was already ready. Um, as he starts to manipulate the device that he's created and it starts to spin uh, and a little bit of light starts to glow from within. You can see him kind of adjusting a dial, a very large kind of uh, uh, gear along the bottom, letting a little bit more and more light come out of this thing. And across the back where the curtain is, um, you start to see uh, dancing figures as this enormous uh, light show starts to begin, uh, starts to, to be displayed. And uh, you, you notice that each of the different levels that he's got there uh, representing different elements of the story. And he has to, uh, has this this powerful light engine in the center that he's using I to, uh, to illustrate. Um, and yeah, you're, you're quite sure you know what it is. Yeah. It must be only a fragment of the star stone. Like it probably is the size of a pea on the inside, but it's more than enough light. And it's carefully designed so that it doesn't let much light out through the back towards the audience, just towards the back of the stage. Uh, and so they start to to uh, to uh, to do the the show that way. Um, so um, while Jonas works the machine, Harriet is the one kind of choosing some of the different uh, elements to display. And in fact, there's one cone that comes off the side of this device, which just displays a circle of light, uh, and uh, 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 Harriet is taking different bits of, of probably wood carved out in different shapes to use them as uh, shadow puppets at the, to illustrate the story. Um, 
and the crowd is 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 enjoying it. It's it's a little bit hard to follow. Um, you get the impression, uh, Annie, that Ezri's read the story. She probably didn't understand the whole story. There's this 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 whole subplot of a maiden that the soldier protects that you're pretty sure wasn't in the original story. It might have been something she added. Um, possibly. And it, and it kind of feels a little bit uh, uh, stuck in there. Ah, but the storytelling is going well. Uh, and um, the thing in the center is spinning uh, strong and wild. Um, what are you going to be watching? Where's your attention focused? Is it on Ezri, on Enri, on Harriet, on, jo on Jonas, on the device, on the crowd? For each one of us, sir? Yeah. For each one of you, on starting the on the device, okay. Following the uh, what Ezri is saying. Okay. Uh, Silas will be looking at the performance, and he's going to ready uh, Mage Hand to try to counteract whatever they do. Okay. So if he starts to see something get shoved to the side, he's going to try to shove it the other way. Okay. Then I will have a and do uh, it subtly. perception check from each of you. Dirty 20. Ooh. Wow. Damn, Pat. Natural 20. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Your dice are loaded. So we'll start with the lowest, which is an 18. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> as you're paying attention to this device, uh, uh, Medric, um, you're noticing that it is starting to heat up, um, even with all the precautions and the, and the probably pretty considerably heavy metal that was used in the construction of this. Um, it's, it's still straining a bit under the, the actual effect of the star stone itself. Jonas knows how to build a container that can display the light. That's, that's literally what he did at the lighthouse. Um, so it's, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a smaller, probably more rushed version of the of the normal device he's using. He's paying attention to the smooth working. He's got kind of this crank he's using to kind of keep the, the images moving, uh, and so he's 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 right there. But he may not be noticing that it's getting a little bit hotter than he expected. Uh, <laughs> that's right. The world is not ready for video technology. Um, for the next highest, which is Annie. Um, uh, you're listening to uh, to Ezri's story. And again, there are parts of this story which you're pretty sure she made up, uh, but she's not a bad storyteller. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, she has stories she wants to tell, clearly inspired by the romantic tale of the few that she's been able to read. And you know the other book that she was reading, which had a very different history of... Uh, of, uh, of the Alarian region and how the kingdom came to be. Um, this story is more of a traditional tale. Sorry, did someone want to jump in there? I thought I heard somebody. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. I was just commenting that Jonas is the AV club. It's true. It's true. Um, but you, you kind of notice that she falters a couple of times in her words. Uh, and oh. she's looking over at, 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 uh, at Henry, who's doing these, terrible sounds that are as hilarious as they are inappropriate sometimes uh you're pretty sure that when the when the giants came in the hill giants came in they probably weren't constantly farting for like five minutes but apparently they sound like they were and she's i mean so she's, that would be a really really good attack like giant <laughs> farts come on it, it, it totally would you could bottle those and sell them at the market or online on twitch um Save versus poison damage. Yeah, save versus cloud of poison. Uh, uh, but she's every once in a while her she's she's kind of she's laughing a little bit at that. But every once in a while she seems to laugh a little bit more, and you're thinking hey, maybe nervousness. But she seemed like she was getting a handle on this. Um, for you, Silas, you're kind of looking around, going, "What what is unusual here?" and uh, you know, you're drawn back to Henry every once in a while because he just makes these ridiculous noises. So it's a little distracting. Um, but then you're kind of watching a little bit and you notice that uh, uh, Ezri, uh, the, the hair 
behind Esri's ear, kind of this loose lock that's there kind of flicks up at one point and she kind of bats away at it. At another point, uh, she kind of twists all of a sudden uh, and then kind of looks behind her, but then kind of takes a deep breath and continues with her story. Uh, and uh, there's a number of little things which seem to be keep uh, throwing her off of her game, off of her story. Uh, and uh, you're not sure what's happening exactly, but you have a feeling that she's being affected by something. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely throwing her off. Is it possible for me to look at the audience and see if I can mage hand someone something? Silas is suspecting that someone is using mage hand to uh, affect her. You can certainly take a take a, a gander out towards the crowd. Um, what I will say is make a um, we call this an investigation check. Make it with advantage. Partially because you're kind of keeping an eye on Esri and able to kind of look at any timing that might happen. Wow. Natural funny. Is that a, yeah. Wow. What the fuck? Wow. Yeah, watch me roll nothing but ones during the actual performance. That's, that's, that's <laughs> wild. That's wild. Um, yeah. So you're kind of, I, I would imagine, kind of looking towards the, the, the crowd and trying to keeping uh, Esri and I and, and kind of looking at every time she twitches or, tw or twists a little bit. Uh, almost as though she's being tickled. And you look in towards the crowd and kind of look at everybody. And there's a lot of people laughing in different little groups. And you kind of spot someone moving through the crowd very slightly, very, uh, very casually. And every once in a while from underneath, uh, again, sort of the same figure that, that, uh, that uh, Medrick had noticed earlier with a, a sort of uh, a, a we, uh, worn gray green cloak over the head slight fairly uh, short kind of uh from beneath their cloak kind of points outward and in the end of a of a wand can be seen poking out every once in a while and that's when Ezri kind of jerks a little bit and then it's quickly put away they're about uh about 60 feet uh beyond you but there's a big crowd between you and them it's a pretty packed room too uh Okay, just a second. I gotta see range of that is. Yeah. Uh sadly not close enough for uh Mage Hand. Close enough However, for it is close enough for Fairy Fire. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, so let me check. <laughs> uh, were you trying to stealth? <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna fairy fire and light up everyone in the area in green uh, glows. Uh, Yeah, basically it's a 20-foot cube centered on uh, that guy. Okay. <laughs> and he will glow for at least, ne or for the next minute, uh, but it's concentration. Okay, it is a, uh, a uh, save spell. Save nope. Versus, uh, uh, actually, save. sorry, yeah, it's a uh, dex save, yeah. Yeah, what's the, uh, the save DC? Uh, that went up recently. 4, 7, 15. 15. Okay. Um, okay. Well, um, as you're kind of doing this uh, and you notice that their attention is, is towards the stage and you cast your spell, the people around you kind of look towards you, but it doesn't appear that they noticed you since they were rolling at this advantage and then roll a one. Um, as the, the effect, uh, hits in that, that, uh, general area and numerous people are, are hit by the, the sudden glowing, glittering, uh, purplish, uh, effect. Uh, and yes, it seems centered on them. They seem to be quite surprised. They look over towards you and within the hood, you can make out, uh, just a, a, a very thin waifish feminine face with tiny little glowing green eyes. Uh, and they uh, they turn, tr 
turn invisible, but are outlined happily by the fairy fire as they try to make their mm -hmm. way through the crowd. Stuck it out. does, however, draw a, a, a attention in the crowd. And in fact, on the stage, they stop for a second. Yeah. Um, si Silas will shout, uh, uh, stop interloper. They're, they are messing with the uh, contest. Do I, um, so uh, I'm assuming I see that person now that Silas has cast like fairy fire. Well, you were paying attention to the stage. Yeah. And in that advice. moment, when when uh, Silas casts this spell um, and then starts to yell, you can see that on the stage, all attention is paid, turned now towards the crowd, including Jonas, who is paying close attention to his device and now looks away and kind of misses a step in controlling it. Uh, I'll cast uh, Sending to Jonas. Your device is overheating. Somebody sabotaged it. Take care of it right now. Okay. Um, this is Medric, can... by the way. <laughs> It'd be great if that Medric was cut off. And be like, this is... Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> and for Annie, you see uh, 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 both Esri and Enri look out towards the crowd at this strange thing that's just erupted. Uh, there's a general cry of confusion, uh, and there's a couple of people, more than one person who's like, is that is that part of the show? Um, uh, so, what are you going to do next? The crowd seems to be uncertain. On the stage, they seem to be distracted from the continuing their performance. And they are, the other person has turned invisible, but is still quite visible with the outline of fairy fire. So, do I see this person now that I'm no longer focusing on the device? Um, when you turn away, yeah, you can easily make them out. In fact, you see that they're shoving their way through people. Right, There's also a number of people... Four. There, we're we're uh, uh, the group of people around them as well that seem to be uh, kind of uh, glittering, and they're kind of looking like, is, is this is this part of the show? I don't I don't understand. What's the range on hold person? Oh shit, bricks! I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's six feet. Double checking. As they are are booking it, but sixty feet. 60 feet. I'm going to have you make a roll to cast it before they go outside of the range because they are about 40 feet away and they're starting to move quickly through the crowd, but the crowd is thick. So I will have you make a, uh, hmm, let's call this an arcana roll to try to get the spell off a little bit qu quicker than you, you normally would. Fuck, I have like I mean, minus one for I'm, arcana. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if they're 40 feet away, they would have to have a 40 foot move speed at difficult uh for difficult terrain so yes they would that is accurate so am i still roll rolling for arcana or just like rolling straight up d20 um you're rolling uh, arcana okay basically to time this just quickly so you catch them before they leave 16 with a minus one modifier <laughs> all right uh that... and that's a level four whole, whole person level four okay why can i not i forgot to link one thing and now i'm Having to search. Uh... Oh, actually, never mind. Because uh... so level three, because level four just let me lets me hold another person, but I don't need to hold another person. Okay. Um, yep, you are able to catch them right on the edge as they are trying to push through and moving more quickly than you expected. What is the save? Fifteen. Okay, but what uh, what's that? Uh, shit, I just closed the book. I believe it's Wisdom. Here, I have it here. Uh, wisdom saving throw or be paralyzed. Wisdom? All right, that's what I thought. Yeah. All right, we'll see here. 12 is not enough. Ooh, it is held. Ah, uh, as as they freeze in place uh, partway through the crowd, this, this strange, invisible, uh, yet uh, sparkly outlined uh, person... And I'll tell Annie and Silas, get him right now. So the crowd is starting to get more agitated. Are you going to do anything about that? Because it looks like they may just sort of stomp over in the wrong direction. Um, Silas, uh, if I can take my turn now, Silas will basically tell, I say, everyone calm down. We've got this. 
and then he'll dimension door himself and Annie uh, as close as possible nice. to the guy. <laughs> it is I have a, a thickly, 500 foot range. It is a thickly packed crowd, however. You need an open space to teleport mm -hmm. to. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, as close as possible. Uh, okay. If he's running towards the door by the door, basically. He, he hadn't made it out through the crowd, but you could you could appear on the other side of the crowd. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. somewhere as close to the edge, uh, the edge of it as possible. Okay, make a persuasion check as you then reach out, grab Annie's arm. And Annie, you feel yourself sucked through a portal. Like squished through an entirely other dimension. And then thook, come out the 16. other side. Sixteen. Sixteen. Okay, the crowd seems to recognize the voice um, because it has been the voice of numerous events in town uh, and starts to wonder what's going on, look over in your direction, and you vanish. <laughs> so they're momentarily at least confused, if not necessarily calmed. Um, but, Medrick, you have it held. Annie, um, you've appeared on the other side. You can see this outline of someone being kind of mid-stride, but still, it's still invisible. Again, cool. kind of weirdly outlined. Uh, I am going to the way, and I'm going to go to the the person. Flash your badge. I need to to get there. Okay. Um, Officer Annie. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, it's easy enough. People people recognize you. You have the badge of office as well. Um, they're kind of at the moment. <laughs> they're all looking away from you because they were looking towards where uh, Silas had spoken up. So they're like, "What?" And, and then they turn around, and he's there. Yeah. Uh, as you make your way through, it's easy enough to make your way through. Um, you uh, again, uh, you're standing right beside. Uh, they're entirely invisible, so other than the outline, you can't make out any details. Once I get 10 feet. That means you know they're there. So, you still don't um, pick out any details, though. I'll grab onto them. Yep. You can, you, can, you can do that. They're not invisible in terms of that. They're invisible in terms of any details. Yeah. But yeah, you can easily grab onto their arm. It seems like an arm yep. that's thinner than you expect through the cloth. Almost um, and childlike. I'm going to feel around because... Like and stuff. their face, if there's a hood or anything. You can see the outline of a hood, absolutely. Perfect. I pull, pull the hood down that way once they uninvisible. Okay. Uh, I see you, their face. Yep. You, you pull the hood back. You can clearly tell the outline of the hood is there. There's nothing underneath it because the fairy fire didn't directly contact their skin. So I'm just going to. Uh, suggest that it's it's not really not really there, although it kind of is. Actually, it would be faintly there anyway, even throughout the through the clothing. And yeah, you don't you don't see anything. I... Okay, what do we do now? People are milling about now, kind of trying to figure out what's what's going on. the The performance on the stage has has stopped. Um, out of the corner of your eye, uh, Medric, you can see uh, Jonas uh, kind of fussing with his machine. Steam is coming out the side of it now. Uh oh, but nobody seems to be paying attention to what's happening on the stage at the moment. Silas will yell for the guards. I assume with a crowd this size, they've got guards at the like some of the town guard would be around with. Um, yep. Or for someone yeah. to go get the guard. There, I mean, most of the town guard is here already because they're attending the performance. Um, mm. And then, uh, hey, Captain Verandell's here. here. <laughs> and Verandell is here, actually, uh, kind of hauling out from the other side. What's what's going on? As the uh, guards start to make their uh, way towards, I'm Virginia's. also like, you told me to do this, but like, what what is going mm. on? <laughs> Silas will say this person was interfering with the uh, the performances. They have a wand of some sort. I'll feel around their arm for a wand. Okay. Um, make a. Uh, actually, they're they're completely unable to do anything about it. So it, it only takes you a little bit of time, really, before you locate essentially an inner wand pocket uh, in the inside. The inside of the cloak feels very soft, 
and downy and expensive. Whereas I the outside looked very, is. very ugly. I have a thought as to who this might be, but uh... yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, I'm just. You can easily pull it out. You have it. You have it. It's it's uh, as soon as you pull it away from them, you see that it looks like uh, a a uh, a kind of a odd shaped wand. It's got this sort of spiral wood on the outside, and the end looks like a finger. It looks like a hand with a finger pointed out. His Z. Um. The invisibility is holding for the moment, so unless you do something, yeah. it's still going to be there. The guards are starting to surround yeah, yeah. and break uh, your concentration. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I mean, Silas will go up and try to find the other arm uh, and then just. Uh, well, at least until. Like, if the guards are getting close, he'll just wait for them, but. Until then, yeah, he'll just uh, kind of gently, not gently, slap them, like uh, a in an attempt to break the concentration. Or... Okay. Um... Actually, no, he'll use mage hand to try to tickle them. <laughs> <laughs> like back at you. All right. Uh, go ahead and make. Uh, let's call it an attack roll. And then we'll have them make um, a sort of resistance roll. Come on, Silas, you get in twenties. Call this a. Hey, this is fuck. This should... I get it. I got a natural today. one. Um, Here's where my ones are coming in. <laughs> uh, it, it, you're pretty sure. I mean, it's a little inaccurate, but you're pretty sure with the mage hand. Do you see the mage hand floating Wait. around? And every once in a while, it stops. Something to keep in mind would be wouldn't. Uh because of fairy fire uh yes actually oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would mean i had an 11 so yeah, yeah that, it's still a 14 that resistance the, yeah yeah it can, essentially you're having a hard time finding like a, an actual spot of flesh it seems to be the cloak is mostly being what's hit or you imagine it probably is because the fear the the magic mage hand is kind of bumping into something but not mm. not quite uh touching. i'm not used to using it this way yeah yeah um but it doesn't seem like if they're concentrating, it doesn't seem like it's coming out. The guards have now kind of pushed their way through, and they're looking kind of a little oddly at this somewhat semi-invisible thing. One of them reaches out as if it's an illusion, and his hand rests on something. Oh, okay. Does break through concentration? Doesn't seem to. Damn it. <laughs> um... How long does whole person last? It's like an hour, right? Uh, one minute, I think. Oh, one yeah, minute. Okay. Same with fairy fire. We'll say that they're both about halfway through then. If people have been moving through the crowd. Cool. I'm going to suggest that Silas, we should probably like drag them out from the middle of the crowd, maybe, towards. Yeah. Um, it paralyzes them. them so. Silas, of course, will... I don't have command. The guards yeah, are looking will whisper at, at... into their head, or at least the rough approximation of their head. <laughs> uh, do you have to be able to see them the... to do that? Yeah. <laughs> release the. Uh, yeah, if the if telepathy doesn't work, he'll just whisper it. Sure. Uh, release the spell, or we'll have to force you to, and that might be unpleasant. Oh, there's no response. Uh, the guards are standing there, like, so. What What do you want us to do? Uh, we can take them out of here, I guess. I don't know. I think they were trying to uh, spoil there's... the performances so that the one they're supporting wins. There was a, there's an enormous whoosh. Level of fraud. There's an enormous whoosh on the stage, and a and a and a gust of of steam blows out from the stage and kind of shifts out over the edges, uh, and uh, it it's warm steam, but not hot steam. Thankfully. Uh, and Medrick, you kind of look over and see that Jonas is kind of uh, clearing his his uh, brow off of some sweat. Uh, and Harriet's no explosions. Uh, great. <laughs> uh, Harriet's kind of trying to look like what she's going to explain. And you hear from the from the uh, uh, cone from uh, from uh, Henry. Ta-da! 
<laughs> as if that was the planned <laughs> end of the whole thing to begin with. And the people are kind of, some of them are kind of turning back and clapping. Others are really confused at this point. Uh, nice, nice try, kid. <laughs> He's got talent. The, uh, the effort was there. Uh, yeah, like I noticed that she was contain a laugh. The, the entire time. Like now that the device is not exploded, I'll make my way to the uh, invisible person. Okay. That's now like the, slightly visible. But there's four guards here now, and they're kind of just slightly semi ringing this to to basically shove everybody else out. Say nothing to see here. Watch your watch your show. Yeah, if they we can't watch the show something... because this person is interfering with it. Uh, one yeah, of them the turned manacles, then we could put them on. Uh, the the guard seems to look to Annie for instruction. I have a, I have a hand, and <laughs> you have the other. I have the other hand. <laughs> right. It takes the guard a moment, to, and he's he's looking kind of like this is the weirdest thing that happened to me today. Today. Welcome to the uh, club. And does manage to get manacles. It seems attached to the two arms you guys are holding. And then holding on to the manacles because they can be seen. I mean, like I said, I have blind sight. That means I can perceive things without sight. So, like, it's mm -hmm. easy enough for me to guide to get that done. Yep. Again, they don't, and you don't see details. You only kind of know it's there, and and for for fighting purposes. But yeah, you know where they are. That's the, the yeah. between the the fairy yeah. fire and the blind sight. Uh, and once they get them in manacles, they start to drag and kind of are weirded out because the okay they, so they, they have the manacles i'll release the hold then okay uh in that point the uh let's see what the guard how good their guard reaction is i mean i'll let them know ahead of time obviously i guess well I basically held, they, they held on to the, the the manacles and started a pull the person didn't move so they started putting weight on it and then you release the hold and they kind of shoved back oh. uh and go go stumbling uh, well, i would have continued Drag, like dragging them because dragging yeah. by the wrists isn't that that one guard that was holding under the wrist he fell over but the rest of you have a hold on them uh and you start to uh you start to put, pull them out um uh let's see annie you're probably the closest well actually no uh uh, uh silas you were kind of trying to whisper in their ear so you're fairly close as well uh as you hear a a small voice somewhat familiar uh, female voice um, start to um, use words they probably shouldn't at this particular age especially at the given stature that they should have uh, as you recognize the voice of Sable um, swearing and kind of whimpering a little bit trying to <laughs> trying to get away from everything let me go let me go and now we have to deal with with, with this legal mess. And the, the guards are kind of picking up behind Thanks, and kind Sam. of shoving shoving them forward. Silas will uh, will say, "Are you done with this?" It was just a bit of fun. You are hurting people's livelihoods. No. Yes. They may have won. You made that hard for them. You're going to win. Oh, I might win. Snap. They were doing this for Silas. Ah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now I can't win fairly. Because you cheated for me. They can't know who I am. This will go badly for everyone. Hmm. No talking to the prisoners. Right. One of the guards kind of shoves shoves them forward. Uh, There's another. The so we'll do whatever we want. Thanks. There's one more performance before mine, isn't there? Uh, yes. Okay. Here's one scheduled. Um. And in fact, uh, at this point, the the uh, uh, the the mysterious has gotten back with a little bit of effort. Gotten back his uh, his. Uh, speaking horn from uh, from Esri and is now kind of 
Thank you to the the light show and trying to escort them off the stage. We'll be be back with our next show in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. Uh, I'll tell the guard. I'll I'll deal with this. What's going on? Yeah, Silas. Silas will look at Annie and nod. Are you Uh, sure? This one seems to be a tricky one. I I think I can handle it. Silas will go back to the crowd and get people to go, everyone, it's it's done. Let's get back to the celebrations and try to keep the eyes off of uh, Annie and Sable. The the guards uh, are kind of I'll, like... I'll get a chance to restart. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the guards are kind of, uh, kind of looking at each other like, what do we do now? <laughs> As they as they they kind of shadow um, Annie on the way out anyway, they've they've let go and kind of presume that you have a hold of them, but they're still with you, kind of making sure that nothing else happens. Uh, they don't pay attention to where uh, Medric or Silas end up. Um, Silas, you can make a, a persuasion check just to kind of generally redistribute the crowd. Their attention is kind of a little bit divided. There's a lot of chatter among the crowd now as they're kind of trying to figure out. So what was that anyway? And what did we just see? And was that part of the performance? I get a 12. Okay. Yeah, you're not having a lot of influence in the moment. Uh, the Barker's having a bit better a uh, bit better time of it. Uh, Medrick, you happen to glance towards the stage. You can see that they've, they've been pulled. They pulled their cart off the stage now. Oh, man. Um, and, are, and are making their way to the back. Uh, Annie, you um, make your way on the outside of the, of the tent. Adele is saying that I'm, I've, I've gone. Did, does he follow along? Uh, after a second or two, you see him pop out of the tent. Oh, there you are. What was this all about? And he walks directly up to the person. I've got a problem. <laughs> Let's see who you are, shall we? What's going on? And he goes to pull the, the hood back off of the person. I, I, I say, can, can you have you, they, them go, please? I know what's going on. Uh, he looks a little confused. Um, is it safe? Yep, it's perfectly fine. Make a persuasion check. Because he trusts you, but he also knows that something just went wrong. That, that, that's a, a 29. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah, you just give him that nod and he's like, well, okay. It's fine. <laughs> the rest of you, get yourselves back in there in case there's any other problems. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, sure. And they kind of you see that moment where they're like which one of them is actually in charge here i'm not going to question it i got work to do gotta mm-hmm. go back inside i just want to get paid and go i, get I go around the corner like in an alleyway with with them i'm like okay sable mom voice comes out <laughs> Oh, snap. <laughs> uh, and there's a look. Verandell has followed you. Uh, there's a look as soon as the name Sable comes out. And he pulls back the hood. Oh, crap. What the hell is going on here? Sable turns to him. And you can see that there's sort of a charm offense going on, offensive going on here. It's all a misunderstanding. I should go. My parents will be no. wondering where I'm gone to. Sable, cheating is wrong. It's not doing cheating. cheating. I was just trying to help. He said it would help. Who said? And she kind of opened her eyes go wide. No one. You know who. And she kind of gives that roll of the eyes uh, towards towards uh, Verandell. It's like, don't tell him. <laughs> or I don't want to tell you in front of him. Cheating. And Silas is right. It affects people's livelihood. It was just a bit of fun. They were fine. Nobody was hurt. They had to deal with everything else. So I mean, if the device had detonated, that would have been like definitely a lot of people getting hurt. Well, did you just, did you go out with them, or or do you want to no, stay inside? Uh, I'm just okay. like, but yes, that right. if that device had gone up, that might have been a bit bad. But you know, 
Jonas would never create a device that was that dangerous he would bring onto a stage with his kid. Of course not. <laughs> He's totally yeah. f- health and safety all the way. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> ba- basically, uh, I'm going to tell Sable cheating is wrong and what, what you were doing was cheating care who told you it it was going to be okay and it's just a bit of fun the way I hear it the result was fixed so all I was doing was fixing it back what do you mean well it's all rigged they already know who they're going to make win so I just made it that it was going to be the other way From within, I mean, from the guys standing near the stage, you can hear the Barker come back in. And now we have the knife dance of death. And there's kind of a crowd applaud, especially the word death. You know, it's a medieval society. Death is fantastic to see on stage. Uh, and you see a, um, a woman coming on the stage um, carrying a, uh, a, looks like a backpack. And she kind of sits down at one side and she starts to, to lay out several knives uh, in sort of a semicircle around her feet. Um, and you can see on the outside that Sable kind of deflates a little bit. Uh, she's going to win anyway then. If, if it was rigged for her to win, why did you tamper with everybody else's? It was rigged for everyone but him. Silas. So I had to make everybody else lose. Well, we're on issues, Sable. You you don't need to get an you affect you in any way, and what you you did was wrong. It's wrong to sit by and let bad things happen if I know I can do something. It's bad to to let people suffer if I can do something. Hurting other people and by affecting other people. I have to affect other people. It's the only way. And, And I wasn't hurting anybody. Did what you do tamper with anything that they were using? No, I don't even understand how that works. (coughs) Bullshit. Distracting them. That is very, very dangerous. It was just some stupid story. It's not my fault you couldn't maintain the straight face. Sable. Distracting somebody while using machinery is dangerous. I had nothing to do with it's machinery. It's not okay to do. It was a planned performance. Everything happened at a certain time. The person controlling the machinery was waiting for certain cues. Properly. Because the person giving those cues was distracted. She doesn't look really convinced because she had nothing. She, you get the impression that she kind of says it again. I had nothing to do with the machine. I was just playing with that girl and her story. Did you move the tambourine? Yes. So you started, you're affecting other people. Of course. It's the only way to make change in the world. If everything's stacked against you, the only thing you can do is do things that they can't stop you to do. If everything is, is, is wrong, then you have to do something different. I'm learning. 
And I don't I think that's the kind that. of lesson you're learning from your mother and father. They wouldn't appreciate this. They're part of the problem. And Verandell is very confused at this point. Sable, do trust me. I should. Trying to fix this. And that I can to fix the situation with your parents. I can't do that. If you're getting yourself in trouble, get out of trouble. Okay? I can't just stand by and let it all happen. I have to be active. I have to do something. Make an uh, insight check. Medrick is giving her advantage uh, for well. like... 100 feet away, I guess. <laughs> uh, 12? Um, there's something about the things she's saying or the way she's saying it that it, it, you can't quite put your finger on it, but something odd about that. It's not that she's lying. It's not that she's not sincere. Mm -hmm. But there's something, something weird about that. Really, this... So isn't as clear, basically. Um, yeah, it isn't clear. Well, she has a different opinion, and it's very strong. Mm -hmm. Almost too strong. Sable, I understand. If I agree with that, I wouldn't be here. It's not like... It's not like you don't get involved in all kinds of things, even despite who you are. And Varendel's like, what do you mean by that? Ooh. In a moment. <laughs> <laughs> he just did a... <laughs> Quiet, dear. We'll, we, we'll talk about this in, in a moment. Put a, put a pin in that. <laughs> <laughs> get involved but I don't in menial things a competition even if it's rigged it isn't going to kill somebody and that no but it, it's against your friend. And I can see that he's doing good. And I can see that he's on the other side of my parents. I'm fixing that. I've let people know about the situation and from there. Um... I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but I'm not liking a lot of what I'm hearing here. We are going to have to talk, Annie. As for you, Sable. I know. As for you. I'll escort you back to the mansion myself. She doesn't look pleased with that, but she doesn't say anything. And that's a worse idea than letting her go back on her own. Saying this as somebody who's done the exact same thing. Are you saying that out loud? Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're trying to tell me, but we have to talk about this. Maybe you don't agree with all of their policies, but I do work for the Baron and Baroness, and I still work and they for work them. My 
parents. Record scratch. And yeah, Sable's face kind of goes <laughs> blank. He's like, Whoa. and Verendel, he's not an unintelligent man, but he is rather uh, confused at this particular moment. Um, and no, I, I'm pretty sure that they don't. The Baron and Baroness are the representatives of the king and queen. And while I may and consider who would, sending her... who else would have known one of the six? Um, you mean that sailor? Well, there are a number of people who have some knowledge of him, I suppose. Who would Sable, be? Sable kind of just draws in a breath. He's not getting it. <laughs> Like I, I can taste the awkward in this conversation that I'm not even there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I am not supposed to be here either. Well, let me take care of this. You can go back to see the performances, enjoy the rest of your night. I'll handle this. And I'll. My name is Nanny. Um, for the, it didn't get transmitted clearly for me on the side. I know what you said, but I want everybody, anybody who's watching this, to hear what you said. So please repeat that. As an Annie, it's Annalise Montrose. And again, Verandell, not dumb, but also completely not expecting this. Um, looks. Uh, at you. Well, that's strange. That's the same name as the king and queen. Grab him by the ears and shake. <laughs> and there, there's a moment where he's sort of like, you can see the gears working. He's he's shifting very rapidly in perception, especially of you at this particular moment. Uh, when he kind of looks but uh, from you, over to Sable, who just kind of looks at him with the sort of, uh-huh, and shakes her head a little bit. No. That's not. I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> You're not supposed to be here. No. She'll, she'll be in a lot more trouble if she doesn't go back on her own out of experience. Can I go now? It's a sable, and she's kind of pulling a bit at the uh, the manacles. Um, make a perception check, Annie. That's a six. Okay. Uh, this, this uh, we get ten now. seconds. <laughs> oh, we're going to have to call back in this dramatic moment. We'll be right back. So while this is going on outside, the show is continuing inside. A, uh, a young uh, woman uh, who seems to be have some, uh, some half-elven traits. Um, as you may remember, uh, half-elves in my world, the traits are, are diminishing over time. Uh, so the first, uh, first half-elf uh, a progeny of two of, a, of an elf and a human will have strong elven traits, but as it goes down the generations, the half elven or the elven traits start to vanish. And this this seems to be a woman who's uh, who's uh, is an uh, or was a half elf or is, has that lineage. Uh, in particular, one of the biggest uh, features is uh, brilliant green eyes and rather large eyebrows, which are of the same nut brown red that her hair is that's tied down on one side. She sets out a number of, of, uh, of, of uh, knives on the ground or on the, on the stage floor before her. Um, then she starts to juggle a few basic knives as she walks down to the other end of the, uh, of the stage. Both Medrick and Silas, as you're witnessing this, going, yeah, you know, juggling knives. The danger level has gone up a little bit. Maybe this was uh, all the better. As she goes down to the other end, she turns around uh, carefully. 
and then clicks her heels together. As she does so, she throws the knives back to where she had stood before. And when she clicks her heels, she reappears in the spot where she started from and catches the knives and proceeds to juggle them. And then starts to do this routine of disappearing from here and reappearing at the other end, throwing and juggling knives to herself. Uh, people at does first she were... Heels every time she, she does, she like does the reappearing thing or... Uh, does she what when she reappears? Does click she her heels. click her heels every time yes. she does the... Okay. Yes. Um, so she starts to do this this sort of routine. Um, then um, she she hurls the knife up and and uh, in an arc to to land where she would have would have been, and then snaps her fingers. And for the spellcasters, you recognize her casting a spell, as the knife when it lands immediately is thrust back upward, into the air, following an arc back to her. And then she starts to weave this sort of thing where it's partially that she's launching them when she gets down there other times she's throwing them to herself and reappearing it's getting complicated um to the point where she's doing it fast enough that she appears almost at both ends uh, and then someone walks onto the back of the stage a small gnome uh, wearing a pair of drums on a on a uh, 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 a uh, sort of leather um uh frame uh, this gnome uh, is uh, mostly bald, but does have a sort of a top knot in the back of his head and has this very big, bushy mustache. Uh, and some people in the crowd you hear start to cry out, Sergio, Sergio, Sergio. And the, the, the barker says, well, it looks as though Tibra has been joined by the star drummer of D.D. Frock, Sergio <laughs> the Stash. Let's give it up for Sergio the Stash. And he starts to beat a rhythm out and the rhythm she starts to adapt to the rhythm uh and this time it gets to be the point where she's not only throwing them back and forth with each other but actually throwing them up in the air going down catching the other ones throwing those ones back and reappearing to catch both sets at the same time it's a very complicated routine and you can see that she's stressing it for the most part let's just see how stressed she gets well i'm glad that's not getting interfered with <laughs> Um, okay, she's pretty good. Oof, that's not good, though. Uh-oh. Uh, as she times it incorrectly and has to duck as some of the knives go flying by her, you hear a squeal from the other end as uh, the Barker also uh, had to duck out of the way. And as he stands back up, his, his horn now has a uh, knife sticking out of the side of it. Uh, and he gets back on the, on the, mi the mic, though, and saying, wasn't that a thrilling performance? And starts to to draw the crowd as they as they uh, as Tibra starts to bring her uh, her uh, performance back to the to the uh, to a conclusion. Um, meanwhile, outside, it seems we have a lot to talk about, but now is not the time or place. You feel a tug as as once again Sable wants to be free. Make a perception check again. Sixteen. Okay. Um, you notice with this tug that the second manacle has come free of Sable and she takes off running. You do have essentially an opportunity attack because she's right there, but that's up to you. I, I think that him bringing her back will cause her much more trouble than her getting back in her way. Well, Varendel is going to go for the grab. Uh, that does not grab her, but he does reach off in her direction and say, hey, stop. Do you stop him She'll or is he going to chase after back a lot. Try to grab his wrist. She'll get back a lot safer if she gets back on her own. Let the Baron or Baroness. He looks down at you a little hurt. How long has this been going on? And how long did you know about it? I've known for about a week. Yeah. Well, 
Do you know who she's working for, then? She mentioned someone, yes. Are you working for him, too? No. I really want to believe you, Annie. But I'm going to need some time. I will do two lies. And specifically that I was Gaetano's. Gaetano was my tutor. Six. Two lies that I ever told you. Can you repeat those okay. for the record? Does the voice get cut out? <laughs> the, the two lies that I ever told my specific name I, I did say that I was uh, tell but it was what, another one of the sticks. And the other and one? The only two those are mm -hmm. the only two lies that I ever told you. I promise you that. That isn't small. That's all of who oh, you are. Man, I've been such a fool. That this was the truth. Why would I think what? That Annie is the truth? Would you have believed me if I had told you earlier? He looks thoughtful, a little confused. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever know. Sorry. I can cast Zone of Truth and clear this all up. <laughs> At this point, he'd probably appreciate <laughs> modifying memory a bit more. Um, <laughs> I've got some work to do. Why don't you go back and enjoy the rest of the performance? Don't worry about reporting for the rest of the week. Shh. Oh, um, the invitation was technically to each of us, so if you still want to go to the party, I, I, I don't think there will be any objection to that. <laughs> I suppose you could overrule any objection there might be anyway if you wanted to. It. There's a reason why I don't tell people who I am. Hmm. Nobody ever treats me as a person. And I appreciated that. Wanted and part of the reason why I left. But that's just it, isn't it? You're not just another person. No more than she is another person. I need I'll see you soon Annie and you can tell when he says the name Annie he's having a hard time saying that name now and he kind of turns and you can I'll see him heading soon. directly back for the the the, the windmill I'll rush in because I know that I'm in the next. <laughs> <laughs> so indeed, they've they've uh, cleared off the stage. Uh, Tibber was not wounded. She managed to avoid getting wounded, and she held up that for a pretty good long time. The crowd is now intent on watching whatever comes next, and there's a certain sense and tension amongst the crowd going, what's going to happen now? <laughs> We've already had, I think, uh, explosions and knives. What's next? wasn't an explosion it was just a steam venting <laughs> the explosion was stopped 
and so, uh, Willow F, uh, having now given the knife back to, uh, to, uh, uh, Tibra, um, comes back, uh, kind of, the, the, the thing doesn't seem to be too damaged, and he kind of looks a little bit at the scuff, but comes back to the stage, uh, and, uh, uh you know, with, um, suitable, but maybe not the most enthusiastic welcome, uh, and now present to you another local star, the rising of the three with Silas Marsh. And there's a, a mixed applause in the audience. Uh, it's actually, uh, you get the impression there's a lot of people from out of town and they have no idea what the hell's going on. They're waiting for their blood or explosion or massive dragons or whatever the hell's going to happen next. Yep. And I um, like... I'm like, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Think okay. So you walk out on the stage and Silas gives her a quick, did it go okay? We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> As in no. <laughs> um yeah, so Silas uh uh walks up to the front. Uh he's wearing his fine robes. Um and uh, has Gideon flying around his shoulders. Um, you can see now the, and, the, yeah. the Frey family is now up front. Uh, Henry's looking at the at the uh, the flying snake rather jealously. Um, you can see him pull down his father, and his father just shakes his head no. You have a feeling that what the what he whispered was, "Can I get one?" Mm, we'll see about that. Um, uh, so yes, um, oh, wrong mouse. I've got two screens and two mice. Um, okay. Uh, just as a note to Mark, uh, there are two, he will be casting two spells during this. The rest is cantrips. Okay. Uh, the two spells are, he's going to cast major illusion twice. That'll cover the 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, he's got. One from him and one from his ring. Um, uh, also, um, with prestidigitation, uh, what's going to appear is like, basically as he goes up to do this, uh, they can see uh, illusionary symbols appearing on the walls around the area. Uh, probably if he probably on the roof because uh, if this area is like that big, then he wouldn't be close enough, I don't think, to uh, do anything more than that. Um, and there would be uh, the symbol of Ignis in bright reds and oranges, uh, a ocean motif that secretly contains the name of Mother Hydra in aberrant, uh, which if anyone can read it, Silas would be very interested in meeting them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a shadowy figure in a pillar of light, uh, like the, the image of it, not like a 3d hologram of that. Um, he's also using thaumaturgy to make his voice, uh, louder so that he can be heard easily all the, like through the whole area. Um, and, uh, he says, uh, uh, th I, thank you for coming um i know some of you uh but there are many i have not seen before so hopefully you will find this story entertaining uh i shall recite uh he also has the borrowed guitar from his cousin uh that he's using uh so he's basically he's not singing but he's strumming uh, and playing music as he's speaking kind of in the style of an epic poem. Um, uh, and he gives the full name, the rising of the three, the Phoenix champion and his allies, the shadowy mastermind and the sorcerer of the depths. The, uh, um, the words in the title after the Phoenix champion are drowned out slightly as a cheer goes up for the phantom, the Phoenix champion. Uh, just the name alone is enough to draw attention. It kind mm -hmm. of diminishes some of the like name. Golf clap awkwardly yeah. in the he, back. He will, <laughs> yeah. He will 
amplify his voice a little bit extra for the rest of that. Um, <laughs> As I was saying. Yeah. Um, now, there are eight bits, and as last-minute uh, things, uh, I have added a couple of side bits that will bring it to ten. Um, and he starts off uh, talking about the beginning, uh, describing how they got together to help out a brave, persistent farming family uh, and finding things as that uh, were not as they seemed to be in the little town. Uh, dark secrets abound that will need to be dealt with by these three. Um, and as he's saying that, um, the area on the... How big is the stage around him? Uh, it's about uh, 40 feet wide. It's quite wide. Okay. It's only about uh, 15 to 20 feet deep, though. Okay. Uh, basically... He will be in, uh, actually, he'll be off to one of the sides and the center 20-foot cube area. So all the way to the back, but only about the middle half. Um, will take on uh, the appearance of, like, par like, part of the town. Um, as though, like, seen from a higher level. Like, sort of zoomed out a bit. Um, and that's the area that will change as he's describing things going on. Um, uh, he also has, um, how's the area lit, uh, inside here? Um, there would be essentially torch lights. Okay. Um, the torch lights within, I forget what the range is, but like 30 or 50 feet, whatever, um, Sometimes those will change. Uh, I'll mention when they do. Uh, but he, the uh, the flames sort of flicker down a bit and become a bit darker uh, to reinforce the impending darkness sort of feeling. Uh, that's the beginning section. Uh, you wanted a roll? Yeah. So there's going to be a roll to represent each of these sections. Well... He will um, go with, perf I think, this part, I think, is just him right now. Um, it'll be the later sections where okay. any can join in. A few um, a few definitions here, just to, to set the frames here. Uh, up to 10 rounds. You may achieve three successes before 10 rounds. That's perfectly fine. If you achieve more okay. successes, it basically improves your chance of being on top. Um, three failures, however, does kind of end your performance as they basically boo you off the stage. Try not to do that. Um, you're walking into a welcoming crowd. Uh, if they start to turn against you, the DC goes up for your subsequent difficulties or subsequent roles. Uh, it doesn't get any better than welcoming at this point because they are welcoming here. Warm crowd is the next level up and a tough crowd is the highest mm -hmm. difficulty. Uh, the others are coming into a warmer, tough crowd. Um, using the same skill as possible, but a difficulty does go up for two by two. Um, if you use the same skill, unless circumstances have changed. So other elements could be changing it to make it a, 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 a different context for that skill. Okay, uh, so such does, as, each, does each of the 10 rolls have to be a different skill then? That would be the, the easiest way through it. Uh, if, for example, you're using performance and the first time it was a musical performance, then it was a speech, then it was uh, a tap dance, those are three different circumstances. If you just want to do a speech three times, that would be the same roll and that would start to get more difficult. Um, okay. A critical success, however, will impose advantage on your next roll. So it does allow you to get better. Okay. Okay. Well, he'll start off with performance because that's his strong one. Uh... It wasn't an advantage, was he? Uh, not to start. The crowd is a little okay. too rattled. That's it a 17. You, the difficulty is only 12 to start with the, with the Rome crowd, and that's a success. Okay. Okay, uh, then uh, the next section uh, is a bit about um, where we met, uh, basically up with the farmers where we met that uh, bandit gang uh, that had uh, Flip and Flax in it, um, which I will admit 
I thought it might have been one of those two that was messing with things uh, up until I realized, oh, that's a girl. Okay. Um, uh, so basically, at, the, I, at that point, uh, the the illusion area will change to uh, sort of vague ruins because I mean that temple isn't really supposed to exist, so it's it's. Uh, more like just a ruin, an old ruined building. Um, but, uh, and the, he's not using a realistic art style uh, with it. Like the, the figures for the three of them, the Phoenix champion is basically a figure of flame uh, with wings and a big sword uh, for any, uh, basically it's just shadow uh very sl like slim and lithe and uh agile um definitely feminine looking and for silas just kind of a uh like a, a dark blue almost wavy watery looking person uh with a staff he's not really hiding that it's him it's just mostly art uh influence uh, and the opposition will be kind of the same. Uh, he's not going to make it look specifically <laughs> like Flip and Flax. Uh, but yeah, they'll be like weaselly looking roguish people uh, and that sort of thing. Um, I kind of imagine and that yeah, they're that's mirror images of each other. They're like, <laughs> they look the same, but one yeah. is Flip just to make it look different. It's like, hey, yep. aren't those and like a, people uh, who work for the guard? <laughs> yeah, uh, and there's a a, a sorcerer there, and uh, there's a suggestion of something with tentacles and tendrils. Um, I guess let's see for that. Uh, and I'm open to creative uses, like of history or of. Um, persuasion religion could i use deception because he's trying to make it look kind of like them but not actually sit like show that make people think it's flip and flax uh if that's the point you're trying to drive home um that some he's totally to make them other random group of people <laughs> yeah he well he's making it look shadowy and it probably flip and flax would definitely since they were there, we were, hey, that's us. But he doesn't want to actually make the town guard look bad, like it might have friggin' thieves in it. All right, um, uh, you're. You know what? I'll, I'll I'll allow deception as the idea that you're kind of displaying two messages because if Flip and Flax see it, they know what's going on, but everybody else gets the sort of general one. Sure. They, sure. they fully okay. know they mess with the wrong people that one time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If they're yeah, if they're in the crowd, then it's like they're. They're hopefully like sweating slightly and going, uh well, this is awkward. <laughs> Wait, that was the eleven. Not uh, so eleven good. unfortunately is under the twelve, so that is one failure. They aren't turning against you just yet. It does take uh um uh, uh two failures to move it up one category to so you're still you're still within the welcoming crowd range, but um Okay, the next bit actually is where Annie can come in. Uh, as he talks about the lighthouse attack. Uh, as the uh, the three assist a lonely family with an important duty, uh, saving them from creatures of the deep. Uh, an encounter that is only the beginning. Uh, he has some minor illusions of smells and sounds of the sea going on. And the fire, like the torch lights in the area turn bluish green at the point where we enter the sea to save the lady. Um, and he will, there will be some, uh, I'm trying to think, there will be like some flashes of light around the, uh, around Jonas's family, um, indicating them a little bit. Uh, and if any wants to, uh, help out during the fight scenes uh, as they're fighting horrible snaky people. Um, 
I will do background. Fighting in the background, okay. Okay. So with this one, it can be uh, Annie that makes the roll if you want her to use one of her skills. Um, sure. You do hear from the crowd as uh, as uh, Henry shouts out, "Hey, that's us!" <laughs> Good job, kid. <laughs> so I'll give you advantage on the roll because uh, it's been tied to the crowd. You've got the crowd cheering for you, literally. And yeah, Annie's cool. basically showing up suddenly out of like. I just near a crowd all of a sudden making like the the uh, the attacks and I'm making clanging noises to go with combat. So okay, I'm, I'm like fighting. I I am literally fighting illusions. Yep, fighting shadows seems like the thing to do these days. Uh, so so I would like to make a weapon attack at an illusion. Sure, and you have advantage because the crowd is on is on uh, side. Well, that's a natural nineteen plus eight. Yay! Is a second success. Twenty-seven. Okay, um, and at that point, Silas basically because he can move the area. I think uh, basically move I. Like, I think he can do that. Maybe it's only silent image. Anyways, one of his illusions, he has sort of one of them charge out into the crowd and it's stopped and killed by Annie. Okay. Um, what, what is and the, then the uh, illusions centered on the thing again? What is the, uh, what thing, what thing is, is the thing that charges? Uh, out? One of the, the uh, sea. sea devil. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's a very vivid image for a lot of people. And there's a lot of screams as it comes charging towards the people. Um, uh, then, uh, yeah, then he goes on to the next section, which is actually connected because it's the devils of the sea, uh, as, uh, the creatures then attack the town and on the stage, you can see like sections of buildings and there's fighting going on between these stylized creatures and image, uh, 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 outfits um uh as yeah the creatures are attacked uh, attacked the town but they're repelled by the three standing tall with the brave captain verandel and his guards and silas goes oh shit verandel's not here uh so he basically sends some sparkles out towards any of the guards that he can see um uh and uh, the images are from the dock uh, during the fight with Anixia, or with Oxia and the big turtle thing, um, the quen uh, and then there's also suggestions of the quenching of the ever burning flame as the torches almost go out uh, there, uh, and the Phoenix Champion taking Flamekeeper Tidewell's place. Uh, so the fire comes back and uh, Medric is uh, spotlit. Um, in fact. The entire area that met... No, I can't do that. It's concentration. Nuts. I was going to do a uh, fairy fire. Um, <laughs> but then I can't do illusion. Uh, uh, more sense of, uh, smells of the sea and wave sounds, weapons clashing. Uh, some of the people nearby, because, again, the, the minor illusions have a fairly short range. Uh, they can hear sibilant S's coming from shadowy areas. Um uh yeah might as well make a roll there too um okay. uh actually does uh does medric want to make a uh a popularity or uh uh hyping the crowd roll when i when i accent him and uh mm, how would i do that like my performance is not that great <laughs> You could probably just cast a cantrip and make yourself all flamey for a bit and everyone go, ooh. I'll just cast uh, Produce Flame. It's just... Oof. Okay. And it's something I can do easily. Uh, make an Arcana roll with advantage. All right. Hey, There's a 14. 
And a 15. 14 is enough. Yay. Fire. Um. The people next to me are a little bit warmer. <laughs> yeah, no. there's a bit, a bit of a, a radius around you that backs up a bit. <laughs> there's sort of an admiration, but admiration at a distance, like a campfire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, As one should with fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next section is about the machine in the sewers as the three track down one of the causes of the enduring storms. Stormbringer, an ancient magical machine in the sewers. Uh, sorry, my cat is attempting to walk over my uh, printer. Um, <laughs> the lights darken down to flickering green flames and there's a sound of lightning during the fight against the machine. Uh, the lights return to, nor to normal as the group destroys the machine and escapes to the surface. Uh, the earth around the just, I mean, I think it's only within like 30 feet or something, but there's a slight rumbling in the earth uh, as the machine is destroyed. Uh, and during the, uh, as they see, as they see scenes of the, the town having been shelled. Um, and... Uh, at that point, actually, Silas is going to make another performance roll because that's still really his highest one. Um, I could also do an acrobatics roll to try to sell it from behind you. Sure. Yep, that works. As also, the illusion, there is absolutely no mention of Regalesta. As the illusion starts to take hold of this this fight that's going on, you do see a spire or a spiral rather of thin water spin and rotate around the scene. That is not something you, you had created, and you can tell it's real. You will get advantage. Someone in the crowd is helping you. Dad, nabbit. I want to win fair. Granted, this might give us our third anyways. Um... Acrobatics at advantage? Yep. Uh, Say we'll go home and she just goes seven back Seven is 22. Oh, yeah. That's well enough. Okay. That is, in fact, your fourth success. Okay. Now, keep pushing this to the max. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a reward for getting more successes. I, yes, I know. It's time to hang out, cat. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, after that... Uh, the next uh, section of the poem is about the Titan's flight. As the three track down the remaining cause of the storms and find an ancient terror has returned. By the way, his name is never mentioned in this. <laughs> the ancient terror. Um, yes. Uh, you would get a different kind of help if you mentioned his name. Yeah, no. Uh, the three deal with it and the town returns to normal. That that part of the, the poem is significantly shorter than its actual importance might imply. <laughs> um, the flames turn bluish again when we're underwater and the enemy is a shadowy cloaked figure and there are smells of musty, dusty ancient tombs. Uh, during the fight, the lights flicker lower and lower, but as we defeat the unnamed foe, they come back on full and bright. Uh, and the subtle earth tremors... Uh, end as the shelling of the town ends um oh yes yes um for this one i am going to go back and just uh make another performance check uh difficulty might be a little higher but he's got way higher in this than anything else yeah, difficulty 14 now okay don't jinx it 24 no problem um uh, then there's the Hungry Ones, as the three find danger and a demon in the forest deep and end its hold on the knolls and hyenas of the woods. Uh, there are illusionary smells of the woods. Uh, the colors of the torches change and flicker to match the colors we saw as we were going through the pocket dimension thing, whatever was going on. Uh, returning to normal slowly after we beat the Laughing One. Um, anyone have an idea for that? Maybe like have an inter like a intermission so people can like refill up on snacks because everybody's probably really hungry right now. 
Um, well, at the halfway point, Silas actually probably would just take a beat and uh, ask the uh, the uh, concession sellers to uh, come round, as the people are probably getting hungry by now. Um, uh, it's a little distracting as they start yelling out peanuts, popcorn. <laughs> Um, actually, it'll be after the hungry ones bit. I'm sure everybody is hungry. <laughs> Let's bring in food. So long as you're not hangry. Yeah. Um, the hangry one is an entirely different villain. Uh, and actually for that, I'm going to roll persuasion as he's trying to persuade people that they are hungry and should buy food. Possibly getting me on the good side of the circus. Oh. Oh, unfortunately, critical thing. Wah, wah. Can I use? Uh, can I use my? Uh, I have one inspiration point. You absolutely can. Okay. So that turns into a sixteen, which is a success. Woohoo! I knew I wanted that for something. Um. Uh, then there's a short bit about us during the circus events. Uh, primarily, uh, well, there are shots, uh, uh, there's a bit of the illusion of the, uh, the shadowy mastermind atop this shaking pedestal. Um, and uh, another shot of someone who looks like Captain Verandell getting dunked in a booth. Uh, and then... Str uh, strange events as uh, we're underground in the haunted house uh, and there's strange things going on and a, uh, an eerie beholder uh, there. Um, possibly the implication that the beholder was a bad guy that we defeated but not anything that outright says that. He's never going to see it anyway. Um, you do see uh, uh, Willoweth looking rather pale on the side of the stage. <laughs> um, the color was cool. Anyone have a thought on a roll for that? Uh, I can do a performance from behind you acting it all out. Sure. Yeah, he'll kind of interchange the illusion of you with the actual you at times. Um, cool. Nice. Nat 20. Wow. Uh, nat 20 gives you advantage on the next roll. Okay. Uh, let's see. The second to last section, the penultimate, is the new section. The part that hasn't been in uh, any of the songs previously. As uh, Silas talks about the clock winder. Uh, as the three search for a missing maiden fair and a brilliant doctor of alchemy, at which points Sandy and uh, Marigold have like little streaks of light head out towards them. Marigold's not here because um, he's working on Dover. Okay. The, oh, yeah. Then it would just be uh, Sandy. Um, you do hear so two comments from, from them. Uh, one uh, uh, from the two sisters saying she's not so precious and one from Sandy saying wasn't exactly that way, but he did come to my rescue. Um, and they, they track down the warehouse of the mysterious clockwinder who has kidnapped the pair. They enter a secret lab through a portal, at which point the, uh, the torches in the area change to a darker reddish color. And there are mild acrid smells floating around. Uh, the three fight his mechanical minions and oozes rescue the pair and escape just as the warehouse explodes and Clockwinder makes his getaway in a huge piece of a Titan. Uh, there will be the image, there will be the image of the three uh, slow walking out as the explosion happens. <laughs> slow motion run. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, you can hear the guards around the side going, oh, I wasn't that pretty. <laughs> um, I have a suggestion, and we would have practiced this beforehand. Mm -hmm. For this one, a big thing was that cage getting Sandy out of that cage. Possibly sure. doing either sleight of 
using either sleight of hand or thieves tools. Yep. Yep. We can highlight like that. Like free the mating. Sure. Yeah. yeah thieves I like tools that. with a crowbar. Yeah, he'll have an illusion of like the 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 cage will look even harder and more dangerous and spiky than it actually did. Um, you do hear Sandy. It was pretty terrible. Um, you do have advantage because you rolled a nat 20 on the previous roll. Also, Sandy looks uh, slightly younger and fresh-faced. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> uh, that is a... Plus... So, 29? 29. 29 is enough. Very nice. Okay. And the last bit uh, is the future uh what future bright or dark will be met by the phoenix champion and his allies will they track down clockwinder and end his boss's attempts at restoring a titan to life perhaps we will find out soon triumphant music is played by silas as the illusions fade and lights stabilize uh he will focus uh people's attention on the phoenix champion uh if the phoenix champion would like to do something for the finale um Produced lame. <laughs> uh, produced frame will be a repeat. Uh, you're muted. There you go. You're right. Um, I'll just like go like this. <laughs> yeah. How about intimidation? Does he have intimidation? Yeah, but I don't want to intimidate the crowd because that'll put them off. Uh, it well, can be seen as, as uh, a at, show right. of strength. I'll intimidate this to look imaginary like bad guy and scare guy. away the bad guys. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, let's do that. Yeah. All right. Intimidate the bad guy who will not be named. Rah. Hey, not Damn. 20. 20. <laughs> Good stop. <laughs> Good end. The bad guy can fuck right off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then there, uh, there is a bit of a nervous ripple when the word Titan is mentioned because no one's really publicly heard that ter that term mm -hmm. you think before, but again, the legends of the Titans exist. Yeah, uh, well, and but, plenty of plenty of townspeople did see an arm fly off. Oh yeah, and, and they saw an the enormous off. other organ. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's... Yep. Uh, and at the end, basically, uh, he'll leave it that, and then Silas will bow and uh, say. Thank you for allowing me to showcase the uh, uh, the new or the latest version of the song of the three. Um, please, uh, uh, I'll get it now. Pat's running out of words. Um, <laughs> please enjoy the Good evening time. and uh, uh, prepare for the next contestant. And he'll sort of motion back towards. Uh, Willa, and uh, then he'll walk off the stage uh, and go sit down. And he's covered in sweat. <laughs> well, Willa with on the side of the stage. I also bow uh, and follow behind. <laughs> <laughs> Does Medrick bow in the midst of all the flame he's he's uh, creating, or all the <laughs> the, the the heroic pose he's got? No, um, I just sit back down. And, and there is a, a moment of sort of stunned silence, and Willa with back on the the. Uh, uh, the cone uh, kind of says, a little underwhelmed, well, that was something. Shall we hear it for? And before he's finished the sentence, the crowd erupts. In, uh, in, Take uh, that, you cheating tool. In, uh, in uh, flame. No, it erupts in, in uh, laughter and cheers, and the room is fully yours. Uh, everybody's uh, uh, jumping up and down. There is popcorn and peanuts everywhere as everybody who bought any is now using it as a projectile joy weapon uh, as it spills I've out over wrestling. everything. I know how to appeal to crowds. <laughs> yeah, the, next they're throwing chairs and, you know. Um, it becomes pro uh, wrestling. As the, the, the crowd kind of uh, celebrates and many of them come towards you, Medrick, uh, some of them are gently patting you on the shoulder and then they start to pick you up uh, as if to, to kind of carry you. You do hear, <laughs> you do hear Treasure comments, bang. though. It's like, God, he's a little warm. I know, I know, but just it's pretty heavy. deal with it. I, uh, I just make sure, like, my 
coin purse and like none of my belongings are going missing as I look like I'm enjoying the crowd surfing experience. Well, and, and they're, <laughs> they're picking you up almost kind of like chair like. Um, you do, you okay. do again hear the kind of comments about how hot you are because at first you're like, oh, well, yeah, of course I'm hot. And then you realize, no, no, the surface of your skin is actually hot to the touch. Uh, so they're having a little bit of time jostling, but with enough of them there not having to touch too long, it's kind of the equivalent of trying to run through a hot uh, beach, but instead they're trying to hold it's you up. It's a game of hot potato, yeah. only hot cleric. <laughs> game of hot cleric. Yeah, um, uh, that, that's the Phoenix <laughs> champion. He's so hot right now. Hey. <laughs> Um, but they do kind of march you around the room. Uh, it gets a little bit out of control for a while, and it just sort of spirals for a while for the next few minutes. Uh, as uh, Willoweth is trying to shout with his his uh, horn, it's like, it's all very well and good. That's, that's very well and good. Please, everybody. Oh, yeah. And they start to Sil assemble the next group on the stage. Yeah. Silas will attempt to calm things down, too, because he is doesn't want the, the performers having a hard time here. Yeah. So, but yes, uh, and his voice will go, and he'll just say, "Please, please, respect and respect the next entertainer. Give them your uh, attention." As the as the the sound of a powered uh, thaumaturged lute grinds into the room as one of DD Rock uh, takes the stage, Rock. the whole the whole audience seems to kind of st uh, be stunned in that moment into a silence. Uh, as uh, sure enough, uh, you hear the, the sound of uh, the uh, Sergio, the stash, uh, kind of one, two, one, two, three, four. And he starts banging on his drums. And sure enough, this is the fantasy equivalent of a hard rock ZZ Top uh, kind of grooving performance. Uh, they play for the better part of an hour. They're not even a contestant. Uh, they're, they're literally there to, to perform. And they take advantage of the the big state where you left them and they take control of the crowd and in a way that you've seen before and you did very very well they are seasoned entertainers um you got to imagine that not a single one of them is under the, under 200 uh, and they've been doing this for practically 200 years so uh, keith richards it's yeah well um is there a mosh pit absolutely uh the younger <sighs> members of town are, are getting into it uh, it gets a little bit rowdy at times, but Willow F manages to kind of calm them down from here and there. So there will be other positive consequences of this beyond, of course, uh, quite clearly winning this contest. Um, but I will elaborate those over my next couple of weeks and give you a chance to uh, give you a chance to know. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this crazy contest idea that I had. Uh, hats off to all of you. I didn't know how the moment with Annie was going to go. That was very interesting. And Medrick uh, kind of showed up for everyone as well. So I'm going to give you all advantage, or sorry, give you all an inspiration for what you did. Uh, and then we'll move on next time in two weeks. Any last words you'd like to make about uh, this, uh, this session or any last comments from the characters? If not... Go Wild Stallions! I was expecting that to happen happen not how i expected that to happen i will take yeah that i was like moment. emotionally compromised by that scene between annie and verandale <laughs> it's like <laughs> that, ah. was, that was yeah i didn't know when that scene was going to happen but i yeah i had the feeling that someday at some point there would be a confrontation uh the fact that sable was there was even I'm better trying, yeah. i'm trying to squeeze it in before because in case my uncle sees me and recognizes me and shit hits the fan there. I'd prefer him knowing before. <laughs> Indeed. Was he in the Haven't crowd? Really had the I moment. don't know. Yeah. But the, the fact that Berendel called her Annie, it's like there, there is hope for the friendship to continue. <laughs> she really just wants to be treated like a regular person, y'all. Yeah. yeah. Poor and Verindel. if you need a zone of truth, I, I can totally supply that. Yeah. No, poor Verindel, caught between duty, honor, his lifelong uh, uh, understanding of how things work, and what he's had confronted in front of him. So, and you know, a Titan being put together, and Terra is coming back. I mean, the props. There's no good time for the emotional turmoil, but yeah, when the world is coming to an end, that also puts an extra stressor on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank my players for, for jumping in uh, with both feet and I uh, hope you guys had fun in this unusual session. Different kind of conflict, different kind of moment. 
Um, you'll be able to see this uh, if you're watching live. The replay will be up on YouTube within a couple of days, youtube.com slash ENCAF1. If you're watching this on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we stream on every other Sunday at around 3 o'clock Atlantic time. Uh, you'll see the next date pop up here at the end uh, as well. Uh, by all means, you can subscribe and enjoy. And I hope you have. You can find us on Facebook. Look for Watchers of the Drowned Isles uh, to see the recaps. It'll be interesting to see what the recap is of this episode as well. Uh, thanks to my players and thanks to you for watching. And if you're not thanks watching, for then thanks anyway. Ha, 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 ha.